The Kidnapping of President Lincoln by Joe Chandler Harris Recording by Josh Kibbe On the first day of April 1863, young Francis Bethune of Georgia sat the picture of gloom and dejection in the reading room of the most popular hotel in the capital of the Confederacy. The frown on his swarthy face, his features had been tanned by exposure to sun and weather, was deepened by the disordered condition of his black hair, through which, in perplexity or abstraction, he had clawed his fingers in all directions. Though Bethune was strikingly handsome when at his best, the casual passerby would hardly have guessed it unless, indeed, the young man's singularly brilliant eyes had invited a close examination. As he sat there dejected and unhappy, he could see the southern leaders passing to and fro before him. Robert Toombs, impetuous and imperious. Ben Hill, impressive and genial. Alexander Stevens, pallid and frail but with the fires of vitality burning in his eyes. These men were Georgians, and young Bethune knew that the mention of the name of his grandfather to any one of them would be sufficient to enlist his interest. But he knew also that the most powerful of them could render him no assistance in his present difficulty. He had begun a letter to his grandfather, but had torn it to shreds before he had finished half a sheet. The truth is, the young fellow knew that his troubles were of his own making, and he felt that he must depend upon himself. As is ever the case with many young men, he had been somewhat spoiled in the bringing up. When he was small, no one was allowed to thwart him or to stand in the way of his will, save on those rare occasions when his grandfather, losing all patience, gave him over to a severe trouncing. Thus the spirit of independence which he had developed early was overlaid with perverseness. He had entered the Confederate service as a lieutenant, who in twenty-one years old had been mentioned in the reports for gallantry on the field, and later had been elected captain of his company. Then, as might have been expected, he shortly found himself at cross-purposes with no less a person than his colonel, and immediately proceeded to inform that officer what he thought of him in general and in particular. He was saved from the worst results of his insubordination by the fact that the colonel knew Bethune's grandfather, Meriwether Clopton, and was very fond of him. Instead of organizing a court-martial, the colonel allowed the young man to resign. It was a seasonable experience, and a sobering one. Francis Bethune had a great many fine qualities to sustain him, and he fell back on these instead of giving way to despair. But it was a trying time for the young man. His vanity took wings, and with it nearly all his youthful folly. Yet it was not his native strength that saved him at last, but the thought of two women and a girl. One of these was Sarah Clopton, his aunt, who had been the only mother he had ever known. Another was Miss Puella Gillum, a little old maid, and the girl was Nan Dorrington. He had a good reason to think of these two women. His aunt had received him in her arms a few weeks after his father and mother had perished in an epidemic in one of the cities of the South Atlantic coast, and had nourished him from his infancy with an affection as absolute as a mother could entertain for her child. The little old maid, Miss Puella Gillum, was not old enough to be ugly and withered. Indeed, young Bethune thought she was very beautiful. When he was a boy and after he was far in his teens, he used to call on Miss Puella at least twice a week. Before he was twelve, he made these visits mainly to get a cup of Miss Puella's tea and a couple of her flaky biscuits, as white as snow. But when he grew older, he went for the sake of spending an hour with Miss Puella, and he always came away stronger and with a firmer purpose to do his duty in whatever shape it came to him. Yes, there were good reasons why he should think of these women, each so different from the other, and both with such high and noble views of life. But why he should think of Nan Dorrington, that awful hoyden, with the feeling of friendliness, he could not explain. Why should he ask himself what Nan Dorrington would think and say when she heard of his latest performance on the wide stage of folly? He had been expelled from college, and he had good reason for knowing what Nan thought of that, though she was but twelve years old at the time. Now he was practically expelled from the army, and what would Miss Spindleshanks think of that? Spindleshanks? He had a good reason to remember the name and to remember Nan, too. He had returned from college, wearing the uniform of a cadet. He was nearly eighteen, then. And as he strutted along through the one street in the small village of Harmony Grove, trying to maintain a bold front in spite of his inward misery, he heard some of the native humorists laughing uproariously. He was crossing toward the old tavern, and, casting an eye behind him, he beheld Nan Dorrington marching a few paces in his rear, carrying a small stick as a gun. 
She had caught the young gentleman's swagger to a T, and the whole town appeared to be enjoying the spectacle. He turned suddenly, his face as red as the wattles of a turkey cock. His anger strangled him, and he stood speechless for ten seconds or more. "'Thank you, Miss Spindleshanks,' he cried in a loud voice. "'You're welcome, Blackleg,' Nan replied as loudly, and with that she whacked him over the head with the small stick she carried, and his military cap rolled in the dust. It was all done like snapping your fingers, and the blow was so sudden and unexpected that Bethune could only stare at the child. His countenance showed anger, but it also betrayed grief and dismay, and as he stood there Nan remembered him for many a long day with bitter sorrow. Her face was very white, and not with anger, as Bethune turned on his heel and went his way. For many weeks, yes, long months, Francis Bethune hated Nan, and Nan hated him just as heartily, not because he had called her Spindleshanks, though that term was all the more dreadful on account of its truth, but because, as she explained to herself, he had made her forget that she was a lady. But Bethune felt on this April day, as he sat crumpled up in his chair, that everything like hate or envy or vainglory had gone clean out of his mind. He thought about Nan as she really was, and as his aunt had described her in letters. A girl of wonderful beauty, living in a world of romance all her own, and yet remarkably practical, too. Generous, sensitive, and tender-hearted. A womanly nature pitched in a high key in which not a false note could be discerned. All this might be so, as his aunt had assured him it was, but still did not explain why, in his extremity, his mind had turned to Nan Dorrington. However, he was about to pursue some argument or other connected with the subject when his attention was attracted by voices behind him. Apparently two men were holding a sort of half-confidential conversation. They were not whispering, but their voices were pitched in a low key. Bethune sat with his eyes closed. He had not heard the men come in, and he could not remember whether they were sitting in the room when he arrived or not. Indeed, he was too miserable to try to remember. But what he heard arrested his attention and held it. A pass, you say, through the Yankee lines? The voice of the speaker was charged with astonishment. Yes, sir, replied the other. That's what I said. A pass through the Yankee lines. More than that, it's signed by old Abe himself. Woo! whistled the first speaker. Doesn't that seem like treason's brewing on this side? If there's somebody down here thick enough with old Abe to be carrying on a correspondence, don't you think he ought to be looked after? The favors can't be all on one side, you know. Ho, 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 chuckled the other. He was immensely tickled. Why, when it comes to affairs of state and matters of that kind, you are not knee-high to a duck. It's like the etiquette of the code, he went on, his voice becoming more formal. The same courtesy that exists between strangers must be maintained between enemies about to engage under the code. And it is so with this bigger duel we see going on before our eyes. Why, there's... Uh, but I can't talk. My mouth is closed. I've said too much now. If Albert Lamar had a mind to, he could tell you some tales that would open your eyes. You don't mean to say that there's a regular traffic in information and a swapping of passes to carry it on? Oh, fiddlesticks. Your suspicions jump farther and quicker than a bullfrog, declared the other, with a note of contempt or disgust in his voice. Take this pass as an instance. What does it mean? Precisely this, that a young woman from Georgia, with kinfolks in Maryland, has been caught spying. She was arrested by Stanton's crowd, and would have been hanged if old Abe hadn't taken her out of Stanton's hands. He had her carried to the White House. Well, I wonder. Yes, sir. Had her carried to the White House, and either she's giving trouble or Mrs. Lincoln is tired of the arrangement. Anyhow, old Abe wants some southern man to come after her and take her through the lines. That's what I'm told, and I got it pretty straight. Well, that takes the rag off the bush. Now, do you know what I'd do if I didn't have a family? I'd take this pass, go right straight to Washington, watch for a chance, and fetch old Abe home with me. That did in the war, in my judgment. If it didn't, it would make a big man of me. It's a mighty fine chance for some chap that doesn't give a red whether school keeps or not. That description fits me to a T, said Francis Bethune, rising from his chair. One of the parties of the conversation arose also. He was the man who had been dealing out the confidential information. Well, here... Hold on, my friend. You are a gentleman, I hope. Bethune straightened himself and threw back his head. My label is on my valise. Where is yours? Oh, Falderall, don't fly up. My name is Phil Doyle. Mine is Francis Bethune. Very good, said Mr. Doyle. I reckon I've heard of you. If you belong to the Bethune family, you ought to know something about the Cloptons. Meriwether Clopton is my grandfather. Then you can draw on me for all the goodwill you want, and goodwill goes a long way sometimes. I had no intention of listening to your conversation, up to a certain point. 
and then I listened for a reason that I'll be glad to explain to you at a more convenient place and time. In my room, for instance, suggested Doyle. Certainly, and the present time is as convenient for me as any other. Excusing himself to the friend with whom he had been talking, Mr. Doyle led the way to his room. He was evidently a man of some importance about the Confederate capital, for his apartments were, for that period, perfect in their appointments. No long time was required for young Bethune to explain to Mr. Doyle his position and his lack of prospects, and the reasons why he was willing to undertake the adventure which had been suggested. "'Do you mean to tell me,' Mr. Doyle exclaimed, after the explanation had been made, "'that you propose to make an effort to fetch Mr. Lincoln out of Washington?' "'Certainly. What else can I do? Look at my position and prospects.' Mr. Doyle drummed on the table as though lost in thought. Bethune's imagination conjured up the face of Nan Dorrington, and she seemed to be looking at him through a vague mist, not angrily or contemptuously, as was her habit, but with surprise and sorrow. At that moment there came a sharp rap on the door, and Colonel Albert Lamar walked in. "'Excuse me, Doyle. I didn't know you had company.' "'Why, hello, Bethune,' he exclaimed, recognizing the young man. "'What are you doing here?' "'By the by, did you know—' He paused, took a cigar from his mouth, carefully removed the ash with a wooden toothpick, and blew his breath softly against the glowing end. He evidently had something on his mind which he had intended to speak of. "'Did I know what, Colonel?' Bethune asked. "'We'll speak of it later. Tell me about yourself. How are you getting on and everything? In short, give me the news. A man who has had to sit up all night with a newspaper to see if his editorial articles have been put in right side up— Never knows the value of news after it is in print. To print it is to kill it dead. Tell me something fresh. Give me the latest army scandal. Has General been on another jag? In answer to this volley of inquiries, Francis Bethune told the story of his own troubles, and when he was quite through, Colonel Lamar looked at him seriously for some moments and then indulged in a fit of hearty laughter. <laughs> some folks might think you get your touchiness from the Huguenot strain, but you don't. You get it from your great-grandfather, Matthew Clopton. Did you ever hear the upshot of his efforts to get justice for Eli Whitney, the inventor of the cotton gin? <laughs> yes, I have heard my grandfather speak of it, said Bethune, laughing. What was it, asked Mr. Doyle. Well, the farmers and men with money in Georgia and other cotton states combined to rob Whitney. They managed to get some of the judges on their side, and their scheme succeeded completely. Whitney came back to Georgia to fight for his rights, and he was taken up by your great-grandfather, who had plenty of money. But the courts were too much for him. He got hold of one judge and frailed him out, slapped the jaws of another, denounced a third in a public tavern, and then took Whitney home with him to Shady Dale, where he stayed for some time. Old Matt was a warhorse, so the old folks say. He must have been, Doyle assented. What was the name of the Maryland lady one of your uncles married? inquired Colonel Lamar in a reminiscent way. A barely perceptible smile crept into Bethune's countenance. At least she calls herself, but I think the entry in the Bible is Elizabeth. She went back to Maryland when the war came on. Colonel Lamar nodded his head two or three times. How old is she? he asked. Why, she must be thirty-five, replied Bethune. But the last time I saw her she didn't look older than twenty-five, and her head was just as full of romantic stuff as a schoolgirl's. She said she was going back home to be a Confederate spy. Just so, responded the Colonel. Thereupon, as there was a lull in the conversation, Mr. Doyle informed Colonel Lamar that young Bethune had expressed a desire to go to Washington in response to the invitation implied in the pass which had been forwarded to Richmond. The colonel looked at Bethune with wide open eyes, in which there was a twinkle of amusement. Well, well, he exclaimed, it's quite a coincidence. What is? Why, the fact that you should be the man to accept the mission. What does it coincide with? With? Well, you'll find out when you get there. I'm not going after the woman, said Bethune. It is my purpose to bring Mr. Lincoln back with me. Colonel Lamar threw his head back and laughed heartily. <laughs> if you do that, he remarked, you'll have a name in history, sure enough. Old Matt Clopton might have done it, or John Clark, or any of the chaps that flourished in revolutionary days. But we don't measure up to such things these times. We're about half a head too low, or we lack some of the muscles that hold a man's gizzard in the right place. Well, I may fail, said Bethune, but I'm not going with the idea of failure in my head. In that case, I'd advise you not to go, Colonel Lamar suggested. But Bethune shook his head. He had made up his mind. He had counted the cost, and all that he asked was that he should be provided with a companion of his own selection. Now that makes the business more ticklish than it would otherwise be, said Mr. Doyle. Whom would you suggest? Billy Sanders. He belongs to Company B of the 3rd Georgia. Why, I used to know Billy, remarked Colonel Lamar, laughing. He's what they call a character, and if he sizes up with my recollection... 
He is just the man that I wouldn't like to take along on such an expedition. Why, he must be sixty years old, and if he hasn't joined the Sons of Temperance, he's likely to get you into trouble. The last time I saw him, he was sitting on the courthouse steps in Harmony Grove, telling the world at large that he was the grandson of Nancy Hart. Can you have him detailed for special duty? Bethune asked. I can. Yes, replied Colonel Lamar, hesitating. But there's a pass for one only. With Billy Sanders along, there'll be no need for a pass, said Bethune. Well, you'd better take it along as a matter of form, suggested the colonel. At a pinch it'll save one of you, but it won't save both. And so the matter was arranged. Mr. Billy Sanders, who had for years been overseer at Shady Dale, as the Clopton Plantation was called, was overjoyed to be with Bethune once more. He had entered the army to be near the young man, but Bethune's company had been transferred to another regiment, and so they had been separated. "'Dog my cats!' exclaimed Billy when they met. "'It's like eating a slice of biled ham to get a glimpse of you. "'They tell me you've been cutting up just like you used to when you was a boy. "'If I'd have been your colonel, I'd have sent for Nan when you got to cutting up. "'Be dogged if I wouldn't.' "'Bethune blushed at the allusion to Nan's youthful attack on him, "'but he said nothing in reply. "'He simply turned his conversation to the adventure to which he was committed "'and canvassed it as far as he could. "'He had never before consulted with Mr. Sanders "'on any matter more serious than fishing rods and hooks "'and traps for birds or rabbits, "'and he was therefore surprised at the shrewd common sense "'which the older man possessed. "'Every suggestion he made was marked by that strange intuition "'which some men possess in moments of great excitement or peril,' and which is the everyday equipment of a few minds. On a large and important field of action and endeavor it is called genius. In ordinary affairs it goes by the name of shrewdness, or common sense, or foresight. It would be a very gratifying thing to make a hero of young Bethune, with his black hair, his brilliant eyes, and his swarthy complexion, but to let justice be done in spite of appearances. Mr. Billy Sanders was a very commonplace-looking man at best. He carried a smile on his red and rotund countenance, that gave him the appearance of childishness or weakness. And he was childish and weak about some things, but in general this bland and innocuous smile was deceitful. It was as complete a mask indeed as ever man wore. There was an innocent stare in the mild blue eyes and a general air of helplessness about the man that went far to confirm the smile. The most cunning reader of character would have placed Mr. Billy Sanders in the category of weak-minded people, a helpless countryman, ready to be victimized or imposed upon by any chance comer. But in fact, Mr. Sanders was a man of far different mold and metal. He was old enough to be a good judge of human nature, and the fact that he was born and bred in the country, and had little or no book education, had not interfered a particle with the growth and development of those elemental qualities which are the basis and not the result of book education. He had, as it were, good blood and strong bones. His grandmother was as perfect a type of the American heroine as has ever been seen, and old Bullion Benton was named after one of his great uncles, Thomas Hart. One who knew Mr. Sanders well remarked of him, He looks like a busted bank, don't he? All building and no assets? Well, don't fool yourself. There ain't a day in the year nor an hour in the day when he ain't on a specie basis. And yet it was not on account of these things that young Bethune selected Mr. Sanders to be his comrade in his projected adventure. His main reason was that he had known Mr. Sanders, and had been familiar with him all his life. He knew that his old friend could be depended on. It had been arranged that young Bethune should receive the pay of a captain while detailed for special service, on learning which Mr. Billy Sanders remarked with a broad grin, "'You'll be the captain and I'll be the commissary.' It was when they met with Mr. Doyle to lay out a definite program that the true character of Mr. Sanders made itself apparent. Doyle had mapped out the whole route in the most careful manner, and had reproduced it with the accuracy of an engineer or an architect. Mr. Sanders put on his spectacles, examined it patiently, and asked a number of questions, which were glibly answered. Then, looking over his glasses at Mr. Doyle, he inquired, "'Are you coming along with us to keep us on this track?' "'Well, no,' replied Mr. Doyle, somewhat taken aback. "'There's no necessity for that.' "'Then this conflutement, Mr. Sanders remarked, holding the tracing up and smiling, benevolently, "'Ain't worse shucks.' The paper so stiff and unruly you can't even light your pipe with it. With that, he crumpled the document in his fist and dropped it in a wooden cupsador filled with sand and cigar stumps. Well, I'll be, said Mr. Doyle under his breath. Me too, me too, exclaimed Mr. Sanders cheerfully. I'm truly glad you said the word. It helps me more than it does you, I reckon. He paused and grew a trifle serious, though he still smiled. I'll tell you how it is, Colonel, he went on. If you was to come down yon way where I live at, and lay off to hunt wild turkeys, and I was to come and fetch you a map of the road you ought to follow, 
What'd it be the state and feelings of your sentiments? I'll allow the cases ain't the same, but you'd just as well try to map out the road a bird'll follow when he gets on the wing. Every time he sees a hawk or hears a gun, he'll change his course. Bethune, who had been so much vexed at the cavalier way in which Mr. Sanders had disposed of the map, saw at once that the reasoning was sound. Mr. Doyle seemed to see it too. At any rate, he assented to the proposition without argument, and after some further conversation in regard to the necessary funds, of which he appeared to have an abundant supply, he took his leave. Later, when he saw Bethune alone, he took occasion to pay a passing tribute to the good sense of Mr. Billy Sanders. And it is a fact that, while Mr. Sanders would have been placed in the illiterate class by a census-taker, he had more real knowledge and native sagacity than one half the people we meet every day. Some such concession Mr. Doyle made to young Bethune. But Mr. Sanders insisted on having his suspicions of Mr. Doyle. It was in vain that Bethune pointed out how he had solicited the adventure. That's as may be, Mr. Sanders remarked. Albert Lamar don't know enough about him to tell us what he's up to. But don't fret. It'll pop up and fly out, and when it does, I'll put my finger on it and let you tell it howdy. I ain't afeard of his capers any more than if he was a hoss, but I want to know what's behind all this correspondent with the common enemy, as you may say. Mr. Doyle tried hard to find out by which route they proposed to reach Washington, but Mr. Sanders hadn't made up his mind and refused flatly to decide until after they had left Richmond. The reason I ask, Mr. Doyle explained, is because I have friends who could help you along and give you assistance at a pinch. This was reasonable enough, but it had no effect on Mr. Sanders, who remarked that there couldn't be two congresses in the same town at the same time, and he informed Mr. Doyle that the Bethune Congress, Billy Sanders' doorkeeper, would hold its first session in another county. When everything was ready for their departure, Mr. Doyle was informed that they would leave the next morning between midnight and dawn. Shortly after supper, he sought them out and confided to their care a sealed document, with instructions how and where to deliver it. Later, Colonel Albert Lamar saw them, and when Bethune told him about the sealed document, he leaned back in his chair, looked at the ceiling, and smoked a while in silence. Finally, he remarked, I've tried to get under the cover with Doyle, but I can't. He's a head clerk in one of the departments, but I can't find out where he came from nor how he got in. But he's in, and nobody seems to know anything about him. As sure as you're born, there's something dead up the creek, Mr. Sanders declared. Well, on your way to Washington, go to New York, said Colonel Lamar. Put up at the New York Hotel, and make it a point to bow to the head waiter. Ask him when he comes to you if his name is McCarthy. Then, when opportunity offers, turn the document over to him. He'll know precisely what to do. <laughs> the head waiter, exclaimed Bethune, laughing. Yes, you won't laugh at him when you come to know him. He's an Irishman. Hadn't we better burn the thing now and be done with it? asked Mr. Sanders. No, replied the colonel. If the paper's what I think it is, it won't hurt you to have it on you should you chance to be arrested. Now, when Francis Bethune and Mr. Sanders were ready to retire, that is to say, when Mr. Billy Sanders was on the point of putting a red flannel cap over his head to keep the bald spot from catching cold, there came a gentle tap on the door, a tiny tap, as if someone had knocked with a pencil or a pipe stem. As the two made no response, but sat listening, the tap was repeated as gently as before. Whereupon Bethune opened the door, and saw a big, overgrown boy standing there, smiling as though he were embarrassed. He seemed to be younger than Bethune by a year or two, and the freshness and innocence of a country life beamed on his handsome countenance and sparkled in his black eyes. He handed Bethune a note, penciled on a piece of brown writing paper, the kind fashionable in the Confederacy. It read, Dear Bethune, the bearer of this is Mr. John Omohundro, a good friend of mine. He calls it my request, and you may depend on him as you would on me. Luck go with you. Albert R. Lamar. While Bethune was reading this short note, Omohundro, while waiting for an invitation, entered the room, closed the door behind him, and, after bowing to Mr. Billy Sanders, seated himself in a chair. He was evidently not fond of conventions and formalities. I saw the colonel a little while ago, he said, after his name and credentials had been given to Mr. Sanders, and he asked me to come up and have a talk with you. He says you're going into the North Country on account of some business of a man named Doyle. That is what Mr. Doyle thinks, replied Bethune. Oh, I see, remarked Omohundro. Well, that makes me feel better. I don't know what you're up to, and I don't want to know, but I think I know what this man Doyle is up to, and I'll have him run to ground long before you get back. I saw Colonel Lamar just now, and it says I, Colonel, who's going to leave this hotel between midnight and day? The Colonel laughed, and said it'd be so after a while that cold chills would run up and down his back every time he saw me. Who told you about it, says he? Nobody, says I, but I heard a man drop a mighty loud hint a while ago. It's a wonder you didn't hear the echo. 
I heard him tell the night clerk to wake him if the men in 78 came down any time between midnight and day. He said they were friends of his, and he wanted to tell them goodbye. And then he took the clerk off to one side, and the two of them jabbered quite a wet together. That was our friend Doyle, says the colonel. You've called the turn color and spot, says I. Well, it was mighty funny to see the colonel roll the end of a cigar in his mouth. Then come with me, he says. He went behind the counter, and I followed along. He says to the clerk, Oscar, is Doyle a particular friend of yours? Not as you may say particular, says Oscar. Well, says the colonel, the men in 78 are going away tonight on important business. They're not Doyle's friends, and there's no reason in the world why he should be roused out of bed when they come down. Oscar seemed to be stumped at this, and he looked as if he was trying to find some way out. So I put in. Says I, if they come down before midnight, you don't have to roust your friend out, do you? His face cleared up at this, and he says, No, I don't, for I don't take charge of the desk till midnight. So there you are, Omohundro went on. Colonel Lamar has paid your bill. I'm going a piece of the way myself, and I have two extra horses for Jeb Stewart's use. If you say the word, I'll give you a lift as far as I'm going on horseback, and then I'll put you in touch with some of Mosby's men. But to go with me, you must start now. Mr. Billy Sanders sighed, turned, and looked at the bed on which he was sitting, and patted the mattress caressingly. She feels as nice as a fat gal at camp meeting, he remarked. You'd better hug the pillow anyhow, said Omahundra, laughing. It'll be some days before you'll lay your head on as plump a one. This Mr. Sanders proceeded to do. He took the pillow in his arms and fondled it as a mother would fondle a baby, to the great amusement of his companions. In twenty minutes the party had passed out of the hotel. On the sidewalk they met Colonel Lamar, bade him goodbye, went to a livery stable near at hand, and in a very short time they were leaving Richmond behind them as they journeyed toward the front. Two circumstances favored them. The weather was very cold for the time of year, so cold, indeed, that occasionally they dismounted and ran along by the side of their horses to keep their feet warm. And the concentration of Federal and Confederate troops was taking the shape that finally led to the battles of Chancellorsville and Fredericksburg. Their course was in a northwesterly direction after they left the city. Omohundro parted with Bethune and Mr. Sanders after making an arrangement whereby they were enabled to purchase two horses which had seen considerable service. In fact, the animals had been turned out to die, but a thrifty citizen had picked them up and attended to their wants so successfully that they showed no evidence of the hard times they had when they went with Stuart around McClellan's army. Bethune and Sanders made their way to Warrenton, then to Thoroughfare Gap, and thence into what was known as Mosby's Confederacy. Then through Ashby's Gap to Berryville, where they were fortunate enough to meet up with three men belonging to Captain McNeil's Rangers, who had been south with a squad of prisoners. McNeil's company operated to some extent in Hampshire County, West Virginia, and it was to this county the three scouts were bound. Now Mr. Billy Sanders had from the first insisted that they should make their way to New York by the western route. He had a good reason for this. Some of the hearts who used to live in Kentucky had moved to Indiana, and just previous to the war Mr. Sanders had made a visit to that state. He insisted that the Hoosiers talked just like the Georgians, unless maybe they took a little more with their nose than we all do. His program was to go to Ohio, take an eastbound train, and make it known to all who were willing to listen to him that he was going to Washington with his son, Bethune being the son, who had been ill-treated by his superiors because he couldn't show the advance guard of the 4th Indiana how to wade through a ford on a creek in the state of Tennessee without drawing the fire of Forrest's mounted infantry on the opposite bank, while all the time the water was running like a mill sluice with both gates open. Yes, sirs, and Mr. Hart, the same being Mr. Billy Sanders's middle name, was going right to Washington to lay the case before Abraham Lincoln, who would straighten out the tangle not only because he was a just man, but because the Hart family was as good as any family in Indiana or in Kentucky, for that matter. It was a very well-considered program, and it was based on the fact that Mr. Sanders had a secret admiration for Abraham Lincoln. He had read in the papers about the President's humble beginnings, how he studied his books by a light would not fire, and how he had split rails for a livelihood at one period of his career. A hundred times he had remarked to thoughtless persons who were abusing Mr. Lincoln. He may be wrong in his IDs, but I'll bet you a thrip to a ginger cake that his heart's in the right place. Being a plain, blunt man, Mr. Sanders made no bones about giving out this sentiment. It was his boast, indeed, that he was ready to hand around his views in any company, and those who didn't like him could lump him. Mr. Sanders' program, to employ his own expression, worked without a bobble. This was due mainly to the fact that the year 1863 opened with very gloomy promises for the Union cause. The people of the North were not only gloomy, but indignant. Criticism of the administration was general, and was marked by a fury which no one but Mr. Lincoln would have been able to withstand. The cartoonists were especially fierce. 
One of the cartoons that caught the eye of Bethune as they were journeying by train to the east was the figure of indignant Columbia pointing scornfully at the president and advising him to go tell his jokes elsewhere than the White House. The periodical bore January date, but someone had torn the page away and tacked it up in the smoking car, where it had remained. The abolitionists had not been much mollified by the Emancipation Proclamation, claiming that it had been delayed too long to produce any favorable results on the course of the war. On the other hand, those who were fighting for the Union itself, without knowing or caring much about slavery either as a political or a moral question, were not at all pleased with what seemed to be the surrender of Mr. Lincoln to an extreme faction, and the slave owners in the border states were denouncing what they described as high-handed robbery. It should be said of Mr. Billy Sanders that his spirits rose perceptibly whenever there was danger to be faced, or whenever there was trouble in the air. He walked into the office of the New York Hotel, humming his favorite air of Money Musk. He had begun to call Bethune honey, and it was all that the young man could do to keep his face straight when Mr. Sanders solemnly undertook to play the part of a fond father. On their first appearance at the hotel, the clerk held them in parley a little longer than was necessary. The house was practically full, he said, and he had nothing but a very ordinary room on the third floor. If they would wait until after dinner, perhaps he could accommodate them then. Mr. Sanders, for his part, said any kind of a room would suit him, provided he didn't have to roost on a pole like a chicken or squat flat on the ground like a puddle duck. Still, his son had been sleeping out nights in the war, and he wanted the best of everything that was to be had, not for himself, mind you, but for his son. Then he turned to Bethune. Honey, didn't you say Mac was stopping at this tavern? Yes, replied Bethune. Well, if we could see Mac, we'd go like we was greased. Do you know Mac? He asked the clerk. There are so many Macs, you know. Which Mac do you mean? A man named McCarthy. We were recommended to him, replied Bethune at a venture. The clerk drummed carelessly on the counter while you could count ten. I know a dozen McCarthys, he said. But anyhow, Mac or no Mac, I'll assign you to a fairly comfortable room. It has been spoken for, and you may have to exchange it for another. All right, said Mr. Sanders. We ain't no ways nice about small matters. If there ain't no bars across the window and the keys on the inside, we'll manage to worry along. Put our names down, honey. Some gal might come along and see him and want to swap letters. So Bethune wrote, William Hart, Salem, Indiana, and under it, Francis M. Hart, with ditto marks under the town and state. Be sure you got it right, honey. I've been so shook up with the kyers and the racket that if a man was to ax me right sudden what my name is, I'm afeard I couldn't tell him. The clerk smiled patronizingly, signaled a porter, and the two travelers were assigned to a room on the third floor. The very one, by the way, in which Colonel Flournoy had his interview with Mr. Barnum of the Secret Service. Tell him to ring the bell good and hard when dinner's ready, said Mr. Sanders to the porter. We'll not keep him waiting. What primpin' I got to do will be done in short order. Dinner will be ready in half an hour, sir, replied the porter, smiling brightly. The dining room is on the floor below. You walk down the stairway and turn to the left. He went out, closing the door gently. A right pert chap, remarked Mr. Sanders. Then there came a quick, firm tap on the inside door. Come right in, said Mr. Sanders heartily. Following the invitation, a tall man, arrayed in evening dress, stepped into the room. His face was smooth-shaven. His iron-gray hair combed away from his forehead gave a pleasing softness to features that would have otherwise been marked by sternness, especially at this moment, when there were a frown of irritation or perplexity. Nevertheless, the countenance of the newcomer was both striking and attractive. Why, howdy, said Mr. Sanders. If I ain't seed you summers, I might have much mistaken. Wait, don't tell me. I might have forgot my own name, but I ain't forgot your face. Hold on. Did you ever so much as hear of a place called Shady Dale? In what state, for instance? Well, in Indiana, for instance. The newcomer made no reply to the question, but his countenance cleared up, and a faint smile hovered about the corners of his mouth. I heard a rumor that two gentlemen had been commended to a man named McCarthy. The head waiter of this hotel, explained Bethune. The head waiter of this hotel, assented the newcomer. I am the man. Well, the gallopin' Jerushi, exclaimed Mr. Sanders. Why, you look like you just come from a ball. Honey, he went on, turning to Bethune, don't you mind the time when a chap come to the grove in a rig like that and the boys run him down and catch him and rode him on a rail? Where was that, inquired Captain McCarthy. All in the state of Ingiani, close to Salem, replied Mr. Sanders. You can't run me out of Ingiani to save your life. Good, cried the head waiter. And now, who commended you to me, he inquired, lowering his voice. Albert Lamar, replied Bethune. A fine man, that, a fine man, exclaimed McCarthy. It required only a few words to explain the reasons for seeing the head waiter. Bethune gave him the dispatch which Mr. Doyle had entrusted to his care. This can wait until after dinner, said the head waiter. I'll join you here about three o'clock. I'm mighty glad to hear you mention dinner, remarked Mr. Sanders gratefully. It is ready now, said the other. Shall I have it sent to you? 
No, no, protested Mr. Sanders. I don't want to be pinned up with my vittles. When I'm hungry, I'll want elbow room. Very well, assented the head waiter somewhat dubiously. You'll have to be careful. This house is under suspicion. There are a number of sharp-eyed government detectives constantly coming and going. You are sure, before dinner is over, to fall into conversation with one or more of them. You'll have to watch your tongues. The smallest slip will be enough. Should I or the waiter, who has charge of your table, change your glass of water? It will be a warning to be very guarded. Should the waiter inquire if you would like a dish of fried spring onions, you will know that someone within sound of your voice is very dangerous. You may come down when you're ready. Say, Colonel, cried Mr. Sanders, as the head waiter was entering the adjoining room. About them engines, I'd like a mess on them whether the boogers catch us or not. Very well, sir, replied McCarthy gravely. On the other side of the door he paused, glanced at himself in the mirror, and shook his head doubtfully. The lad is circumspect, but I'm afraid the old chap is a fool. In no long time they were in the dining room, and the head waiter escorted them to the first table on the left of the entrance, where they would be directly under his observation. It was with some difficulty that either Bethune or Mr. Sanders recognized in this obsequious, suave, and smiling head waiter the stern and stiff person with whom they had just had an interview. There was no other person at the table, but presently two others came in, one a thin young man with spectacles who had the air of a divinity student, and the other a tall man with burnside whiskers. Mr. Sanders was sitting at one end of the table next the wall. Bethune was on his left, and the divinity student was on his right. At the other end of the table sat a small man with gray mustache and goatee. The head waiter came forward with his ready napkin, brushed off an imaginary crumb at Mr. Sanders' elbow, picked up the glass of water, and substituted it for another glass that sat on the window ledge. "'Have you given your order, sir?' he asked. "'I reckon I did,' replied Mr. Sanders. "'But it's been so long ago it seems like a dream.' "'Would you like a dish of fried onion, sir? "'They are very fresh and tender.' "'Would I?' exclaimed Mr. Sanders. "'Well, I'd thank you mightily to try me. "'I ain't had a mess since I left the neighborhood of Salem.' The man who had the appearance of a divinity student leaned back in his chair and balanced his fork on the forefinger of his left hand. "'Salem. "'Salem,' he said. "'Pardon me, sir, but where is Salem? "'Well, if there ain't been no hurricane or earthquake, "'Salem is in the state of Indiana. "'Why, certainly. "'To be sure.' "'What am I thinking about?' sighed the stranger. "'Really, I couldn't tell you,' replied Mr. Sanders. "'The other smiled as he wiped his glasses. "'Well, I should have known about Salem, "'for I went to college with a relative of mine from that town. "'In fact, I think I have a number of relatives in Salem.' "'What's the name?' inquired Mr. Sanders in his matter-of-fact way. "'Webb. When did they move there?' Three or four years ago, I think. "'Sam Webb was the chap you went to college with?' "'Yes,' the other assented. "'What kin was you to him?' "'Cousin. First cousin.' At this, Mr. Sanders leaned back in his chair and laughed until he was red in the face. "'What's the joke?' inquired the man who looked like a divinity student. "'Well, if I ain't got old Granny Webb on the hooks, I don't want a cent,' exclaimed Mr. Sanders with a fresh burst of laughter. "'Here she's been telling me for long years that there ain't a runt in the Webb family on nary side for generations, and I ain't no more get to town before this little fuss cousin runs under my hand same as the tame rat.' The hit was so palpable and so unexpected that even Bethune joined in the roar that came from the others around the table. The first cousin laughed, too, but it was plain to see that he was more irritated than pleased. "'But don't you fret, my friend. Steve Douglas is a runt, but he's a mighty big man all the same. I was the Douglas man before the war, but after old Abe up and said he was for the Union, nigger or no nigger, why, then I was a Lincoln man.' "'And yet,' said the first cousin persuasively, "'they say there are a good many Southern sympathizers around and about in places.' "'I reckon that's so,' said Mr. Sanders.' My farm has been cleared a good many year, but hardly spring passes but what I have to kill a snake or two. Bethune noticed that a great change had come over the head waiter. He was fairly beaming on the guests as they came and went. In fact, he was radiant. His eyes sparkled and his whole manner showed that he was a well-pleased man. As for Bethune, he was astonished at the ease with which Mr. Sanders had handled a dangerous adversary. He had known that his companion possessed a courage that was absolutely invincible, but now Mr. Sanders was displaying a new and a rarer quality. The stranger made no more remarks, but addressed himself to his dinner and hurried through it. As he was rising from the table, Mr. Sanders took his knife from his mouth to say, If you ever come out to Salem to visit your kin, lope out to my farm. It's about four miles out on what they call the Kentucky Pike. I'll tell Granny Webb I seed you. She'll be tickled to death. Why, thank you, replied the stranger. I shall certainly call on you should I ever come to Indiana. So do, Mr. Sanders rejoined whereupon the spectacled man and his bewhiskered companion retired. Later in the afternoon, 
Captain McCarthy went to the room occupied by Bethune and Mr. Sanders, and his first words were those of congratulation. He shook Mr. Sanders by the hand with great heartiness and regarded him with undisguised admiration. "'Do you know what you have done?' he cried. "'You have thrown a big black bag over the head of the most capable man in the United States Secret Service. He is really an expert. He only comes here occasionally, and he is a different-looking man every time he comes. The first time I saw him he had black hair, parted in the middle, and a beautiful mustache and eyeglasses. I always have a peculiar feeling when he comes into the house, and this feeling is especially strong when he comes into the dining room. I believe if he were hid in a closet, and I should chance to pass near it, I'd know he was there. I know him through all his changes, and it is very fortunate that this is so. I invariably make it a point to let him know that I see through his disguises. You do? exclaimed Mr. Sanders, surprise in his voice. Yes, it is calculated, either to make him nervous or to give him a certain confidence in me. I find it is always best to appear to be perfectly straightforward, as you were at dinner, added Captain McCarthy, laughing. <laughs> Why, I had quite a confidential chat with the man not half an hour ago. When he entered the dining room today, I met him at the threshold with, Ah, good day, sir. I'm glad to see you again. <laughs> it was a small thing to say, but it disconcerted him. Otherwise, he would have addressed himself to you turning to Bethune, and the consequences might not have been as pleasant as they were. He would have irritated you, sir, and I see you have something of a temper. Bethune made a wry face. I wish there was some sort of patent medicine that would take it out of me, he declared. Time is the medicine for that. Time and experience, remarked Captain McCarthy. It ought to have been spanked out of you when you was a little chap, said Mr. Sanders, but so far as I know you never got but one lick and done you any good, and that was when Nan frailed you out. Bethune blushed like a schoolgirl, for the incident rankled in his memory. The wounds our pride receives are longer in healing than those of the flesh. Captain McCarthy could see that the subject was not a pleasing one to the young man, and so he did not press Mr. Sanders for the particulars, but addressed himself to more important matters. First, there was the dispatch that Mr. Doyle had entrusted to Bethune. Captain McCarthy invited the two travelers into another room, reaching it by means of a series of connecting rooms. Here, they found three or four men busily engaged in writing at a long table. Only one looked up, and he, with a hello cap, went on with his work. To this man, Captain McCarthy handed the dispatch, remarking, See what you can make of that. The document consisted of about a dozen lines. In this number of lines, there were a number of words marked out by parallel lines, and other words crossed out. The clerk glanced at it and passed it to an older man with the remark, It looks all right to me. The elderly man took it and immediately began to swell, apparently with inward rage. Looks all right, does it? Why don't you learn a little sense? We'll be ruined by you yet. Well, it's out of my line. Get the SK code. Apparently still in a rage, and with much muttering and growling, the elderly man went to a tall cabinet lined from top to bottom with pigeonholes. SK stood for scratch code, and this he fished out from a number of others, a thin pamphlet containing a dozen or more pages printed on tissue-like paper. This queer pamphlet contained some information that was very interesting to Bethune and to Mr. Sanders as well. It assured its readers that a certain word scratched out with one horizontal line meant one thing, with two parallel lines another thing, and so on up to five parallel lines. Then cross-scratching and cross-hatching meant so many different things according to the number of crisses and crosses and scratches and hatches that the reader finally stood amazed at the fluency and versatility of the SK code. The upshot of it was that a document which appeared to be, on the face of it, a very cordial introduction, was about as follows, after the illumination of the SK code had been shed on it. The bearer of this is dangerous. Under pretext of bringing a woman from Washington, he proposes to kidnap the president. He has a pass from Lincoln, his companion harmless, will tell truth if pressed, take initiative, have both arrested and then tell secretary. This should help both of us. Let woman be brought south by ought not rye. It was over the conclusion of this translation that the elderly clerk growled and snorted and finally gave it up. That's all I can get out of the code, he grumbled. The last scratch stands for a cipher, an ought or not. Could it be Autry? Walden Autry? asked Bethune, turning to Sanders. Why, certain and sure. I heard some of the boys say that Waldron went over to the Yankees right arter the war begun. All his mammy's folks live in Massachusetts. Why, don't you remember the chap that come to Harmony Grove in 60, preaching freedom to the niggers and how the boys got behind him and come mighty nigh putting out his lights? Well, that chap was Madame Autry's Massachusetts nephew. Then that is the man, 
remarked Captain McCarthy with emphasis. For some reason or other, this man Doyle wants to get Autry south again, or he knows that Autry wants to go. Reflecting a moment, he turned to the elderly clerk. Mr. Crampton, that dispatch must be recopied and re-scratched so as to give a better account of these gentlemen. Why, the nonsense about kidnapping Mr. Lincoln would send both of you to the gallows if Mr. Stanton's eye fell on it. Of course, such a thing was never contemplated. He paused, and fixed an inquiring eye on Bethune. Well, Bethune began, but he paused. He seemed to be too busy copying the translation of the original dispatch to complete the remark. "'Why, of course not!' exclaimed Captain McCarthy. "'The scheme is preposterous. That man Doyle is simply fiendish.' Leaving Mr. Crampton, the elderly clerk growling and grumbling over his task, which was by no means an unusual one, Captain McCarthy accompanied young Bethune and Mr. Sanders to their room again, where they discussed the situation at some length. Mr. Autry became a new factor in the problem— Mr. Sanders and Bethune both knew him well, and he knew them. Until 1858, with the exception of two college years, he had lived all his life with his mother in Harmony Grove, and there was every reason to believe that he would recognize either one of his fellow townsmen the moment he laid eyes on him. "'What do you propose to do about it?' Captain McCarthy inquired. He had been fully informed by this time of the plan to kidnap the President, but he did not repeat his assertion that it was preposterous. That was for the ears of his clerks.' "'I'm going right ahead,' replied Bethune. "'There's nothing else to do.' "'Yes, sir,' said Mr. Sanders. "'We'll go right ahead and brazen it out. "'And if you hear I've been strung up, "'I just drap a line to Mary with a Clopton Esquire, "'that William H. Sanders, late of said country, "'deceased, being of sound mind and dispose of memory, "'has upped and kicked the bucket. "'Frank there has got a paper that'll take him through. "'If he didn't have, I wouldn't go step with him.' "'Captain McCarthy leaned back in his chair "'and looked at Mr. Sanders with great interest.' The steadiness of his gaze was tempered by a pleasant smile which lit his strong and handsome face. I intended to advise you not to carry out your original plan, but that is not necessary. I intended also to beg you by all means not to harm a hair of Mr. Lincoln's head, but that too is unnecessary. You will find that the President is a man after your own heart. Not every which way, I reckon, remarked Mr. Sanders, making a wry face. Yes, and always, except politics, replied McCarthy. He is the only man of them all who sees his way clear, or who knows precisely what he wants to do. Outwardly, he is a plain, rough man with a kindly nature. If you get in any trouble, simply demand to be carried to Mr. Lincoln. I have more than one reason for giving you this advice. If Stanton's crowd get you, and are able to keep your case from Mr. Lincoln's ears, you will surely be hanged. A few hours afterward, Bethune and his companion had crossed the river to Jersey City, and were on their way to Washington. The first man they saw as they entered the train was Waldron Autry. He was walking about by the side of the coach talking to someone. He had a light military cape hung across his arm, and his tall figure and haughty bearing made him conspicuous in the multitude that swarmed about the station. Undoubtedly, Mr. Autry saw the two Southerners. He paused in his promenade and looked them in the face, under pretense of transferring his cape from one arm to the other. But he made no sign of recognition, nor did they. When the train was underway, Mr. Autry came back into the car, he spoke to one or two, and then seated himself near Bethune and Mr. Sanders, who occupied seats facing each other. After a while, a lady came in, whereupon Autry promptly arose, hat in hand, and gave her his seat. "'May I sit by you, sir?' he asked of Mr. Sanders. "'Why, to be sure,' replied that worthy. "'But I'll have to tell you what the old woman told the feller in the stagecoach. You can scratch as much as you please, but I don't want no hunching.' Autry threw back his head and smiled broadly. Bethune was occupied in reading the Herald, and seemed to be paying no attention to the newcomer. Finally, he put it down and glanced at Autry, and caught his eye, but saw no sign of recognition there. Indeed, Autry took the opportunity of the glance to borrow Bethune's copy of the Herald, which he read for some minutes with apparent interest. Presently, he said to Mr. Sanders in a low tone, "'Do you see the small man in the farther end of the car? The man with the eyeglasses?' "'Well, he took dinner with you yesterday.' "'You don't say. Is that the chap? Why, how in the world do you know?' inquired Mr. Sanders. "'I was the big fellow with side-whiskers. He had a good deal of fun out of me yesterday, and now I want to turn the joke on him. I'm going to move my seat in a moment, and presently he'll be back here. If you catch his eye, speak to him, and let him see that you know him. But don't expose him. Talk to him in a confidential way. You know what I mean. Don't make an enemy of him. Another thing. When you get off the train in Washington, follow me.' I have something to say to both of you. All this time Mr. Autry pretended to be reading the paper 
and his voice was so low that Bethune, sitting four feet away, could only catch a few words. He was very curious, but Mr. Sanders had no opportunity to appease his curiosity, for as Autry joined the group at the rear end of the car, some were standing while others were sitting on the arms of the seats, a small man detached himself from the group and walked down the aisle. He glanced casually at Mr. Sanders and would have passed on, but the man who was so well acquainted with the Webb family of Salem and Gianni wouldn't permit it. He seized the detective by the hand and shook it. "'Why don't you tell me he was coming down?' he inquired. Then, as if making a sudden discovery, he lowered his voice. "'Why, what's the matter? Why, six alive, man, what have you been doing to yourself?' "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said the other with some asperity. "'You have the advantage of me. I have missed a good deal, no doubt, but I have not the pleasure of your acquaintance.' Mr. Sanders drew himself up and swelled out as if he were about to make some loud exclamation. Then he suddenly caught himself and subsided. Oh, that's the game, is it? Well, why don't you sort of give me a hint like yesterday? No offense. None given, none took. If you ever come out to Salem, come right out to the farm. Walden Autry had followed the detective down the aisle, passed him as he stood talking to Mr. Sanders, and now stood waiting for him out of earshot. Who's your friend? Autry asked nonchalantly, as his companion came up to him. "'Oh, I see. It's the old duck we saw at the hotel yesterday. "'He knew me. Did he know you?' "'He certainly did,' replied the detective. "'What's wrong with me? How did the old blunderbuss know me? Am I losing my grip?' "'Why, no. Not the least in the world,' said Autry soothingly. "'The old man is simply a shrewd countryman with horse sense. "'Did you ever try to deceive Mr. Lincoln with your disguises? "'Well, just try it, and you'll find you can't do it. "'You can fool Stanton, but Mr. Lincoln will see through you with one eye shut.' Anyhow, I'm going to hang on to this old man and his son for an hour or so after we get to Washington. I may be able to pick up some information. When the train rolled into the station at the Capitol, Walden Autry managed to be near Bethune and Mr. Sanders, and he insisted that they should go with him. They hesitated. They had not the least confidence in him, but he knew them. He could have them imprisoned by a word or a gesture, and once immured, their lives would be in danger, for Bethune had made up his mind, in case of arrest, to destroy Mr. Lincoln's pass and take his chances with the man who was so cheerfully risking his life as a result of one of Bethune's madcap whims. They had small choice, therefore. In fact, none at all. And all the hesitation they betrayed manifested itself in Mr. Sanders' good-natured protest. "'We don't want to pester you. We don't want to be in the way. You just show us a good place to eat and sleep, and we'll be mighty much obliged to you.' But no, Mr. Autry would not have it so. He insisted, and they gave a ready if not a cheerful assent. He was stopping at a hotel, and he put himself to a little trouble to secure them a room next to the one occupied by himself. In short, he was fertile in all those little attentions which do not look important, but which add so much to the comfort of those who are the objects of them. They had a late but a very good dinner. Mr. Autry wanted to order wine, knowing the character and extent of Mr. Sanders's chief weakness, but they positively refused. Mr. Sanders, indeed, made no bones of explaining why he wouldn't touch the stuff. It's a little stronger in water and not quite as strong as dram, but it flies to my tongue, and no sooner does it do that than I begin to make a speech about my family affairs good and bad, and folks say that I'm every bit and grain as proud of the black spots as I am of the white ones. So for the time being, Mr. Sanders was a teetotaler, much to Mr. Autry's disgust, for that gentleman had fully made up his mind to get into the confidence of his former fellow townsmen, and, if he could advance his own ends by doing so, to turn them over to Mr. Stanton as spies. But he saw at once that Mr. Sanders's unexpected fit of temperance stood mightily in the way. Under the circumstances, he thought it would be best to go about the business in a straightforward manner. It was just possible, he thought, that Bethune and Mr. Sanders, being in the enemy's country, surrounded by all sorts of dangers, and beset by fears, real or imaginary, would turn for advice to an old acquaintance, a man who had been born and raised in the same community. Mr. Autry had long been what is called a man of the world. He had traveled abroad, he had seen life in all its various manifestations, and under social forms widely different, and he considered himself, not without reason, to be a pretty good judge of human nature. The trouble in this case was that he underrated the intellectual resources of Mr. Sanders. He made the mistake that so many sensible men make, namely, that a person who is practically illiterate with respect to textbooks and to the kind of education furnished in the schools must necessarily be deficient in all those qualities that are said to be the result of learning. Therefore Mr. Autry started out with a contempt for Bethune as a cub, and for Mr. Sanders as an ignoramus. Bethune was indeed young in years, and in experience, but he was wise enough to submit to the initiative of an older head, and Mr. Sanders was ignorant of Greek and Latin, algebra, rhetoric and the like, 
but he was very familiar with the Bible and his judgment of men, as well as horses and dogs, was all but infallible. He had known Waldron Autry a long time, and knew that he had no fixed principles of any kind whatsoever. Consequently, Mr. Sanders was prepared for any move that might be made. The very first trial of wits between the old Georgia Cracker and the man of the world should have been sufficient to convince Autry that he had no ordinary man to deal with, but he never even suspected that the occurrence was other than an awkward accident. It happened in this way. When darkness had fallen and the lights had been lit, the three sat for a while in Mr. Autry's room, talking about the home folk. Suddenly the latter suggested that they adjourn to the next room, which had been assigned to Bethune and Mr. Sanders. "'Well, Zavirs, you know,' remarked Autry, "'and we don't know who may be in the room adjoining.' Mr. Sanders noticed that there was no connecting door between Mr. Autry's apartment and the one he desired to avoid, whereas there was a door between Autry's room and the one he had secured for them, and the transom was wide open. There was nothing to do but to act on the suggestion that had been made, but as Autry turned out his light, Mr. Sanders laid his pocket knife softly on the table. It was a big knife with a horn handle. Once in their own room, Bethune and Mr. Sanders became the hosts, and Mr. Sanders became unusually talkative. He wanted to know particularly what Waldron Autry was doing in this neck of the woods, as he phrased it. How was he getting on? You know, Waldron, the folks at home will be mighty glad to hear news about you, Mr. Sanders declared. Autry laughed bitterly. Oh, ho, ho, ho. I dare say, he replied. They'd show their fondness for me if I went back there now. They would. They certainly would, replied Mr. Sanders solemnly. I'd go back this minute if I could, said Autry in a low tone. Why can't you? asked Mr. Sanders. If you think that me and Frank are going back there and tell everything we've seen and heard, you're mighty much mistaken. We don't owe you no grudge, and as for me, I always make allowances for men under forty. Now, tell me about yourselves, urged Autry, raising his voice. What under the sun has brought you two, of all men in the world, to Washington? Well, I'll tell you honestly and candidly, Waldron, replied Mr. Sanders. We are here on the most ticklish piece of business you ever heard of, and the foolishest. Mr. Sanders was sitting with his chair careened backward, his hands in his pockets. Suddenly he arose to his feet with an exclamation. "'Be jigged if I ain't lost my knife. Now I wouldn't take a purty for that knife.' He searched in all his pockets, frowning and grumbling. Then his countenance cleared up. "'I know where it is. I left it on the table in the next room.' He was moving toward the door, but Waldron Autry was quicker. "'I'll get it for you,' he said. "'Don't let me trouble you,' insisted Mr. Sanders. "'I can put my hand right on it.' He made as if to follow Autry, but as the latter hurried into the room, Mr. Sanders made two strides to the door leading into the hall, opened it softly, and was just in time to see a well-dressed man slip from Autry's apartment, close the door behind him, and take the attitude of a listener. "'Hello!' exclaimed Mr. Sanders. "'How long you been knocking there?' "'Some time,' replied the man, trying to conceal his surprise. "'Well, I thought I heard a knock," and remarked Mr. Sanders, "'but when I get to talking, my tongue runs like a fluttermill. "'Waldron, there's a gentleman at your door.' He says he'd been knocking there for the longest, and I shouldn't wonder. Autry went to the door, and he and the newcomer greeted each other effusively. It was, when did you get here, and you must be terribly busy not to hear a fellow hammering on the door, and, you'll have to excuse me, I was talking to some old friends I haven't seen before in years. While this was going on, Mr. Sanders was shaking with silent laughter, but he was the picture of childlike innocence when Waldron Autry returned to his chair, after dismissing his casual guest. <laughs> you forgot my knife, I reckon, said Mr. Sanders, laughing. But if I hadn't pestered you, we'd never heard the chap knocking. Friend of yours? Well, why don't you fetch him in? Any of your friends is more than welcome. You were about to tell me something of the business that brought you here, suggested Mr. Autry. Yes, I was, said Mr. Sanders. And with that he related, in a way more or less graphic, the circumstances that had caused Francis Bethune to resign his commission, and that finally brought him to Washington. Mr. Autry asked to see the pass, and when he had examined it, he said it was as good as gold. But where's your pass? he asked Mr. Sanders. My pass, replied Mr. Sanders, is like the gal's fortune. For the first time, Mr. Autry indulged in laughter, and it was so becoming to him that Mr. Sanders remarked it and said, You ought to laugh a heap more than you do, Waldron. It makes you look like you was a boy again. Now, about the letter or dispatch, can you lay your hands on it? said Autry. Francis Bethune drew forth a package of letters and papers, and proceeded to search for the dispatch. Among the papers was half of a daguerreotype case which contained the picture of a lady. The tones of the picture had been somewhat subdued by time, but this added to the soft beauty of the face. It was the picture of Miss Puella Gillum. The gentle eyes had an appealing glance in them, and there was just the suspicion of a smile playing around the mouth. The picture had slipped from the papers and lay under the light, face up. Mr. Autry saw it. 
Ah, your sweetheart? Oh, no, replied Bethune. Not my sweetheart, but the best friend I ever had in the world. Mr. Autry took the picture in his hand, looked at it, and drew a long breath. Puella Gillum, he said softly. Yes, remarked Mr. Sanders in his matter-of-fact way. She's still a-waitin' for you, Waldron. For me? That's what we all think. Oh, no. No, you are mistaken. The man good enough for her has never been born. She's the only woman that could have made me different from what I am. Why didn't you let her try her hand? Mr. Sanders inquired. If ever a man tried to marry a woman, I tried to marry her, replied Autry. There was a touch of boyish frankness in his voice. Well, you was a pretty wild colt, and I'm afeard you ain't broke to harness yet. All this time, Mr. Autry had never lifted his eyes from the picture. Finally, he laid it down with a sigh. Mr. Sanders, regarding him closely, saw that all the insolence had died out of his eyes. Instead of the sneer that usually hovered around his mouth, there was a whimsical, half-petulant expression, as when a boy has a grievance of some kind. Bethune found the dispatch, and now laid it before him. Autry took the picture in one hand and the paper in the other, and held them up side by side, then threw his head back and smiled brightly. "'Here is the angel,' said he, holding the picture higher, "'and here is the serpent. If the angel could talk, it would approve what I am now going to do.' He struck a match and held the dispatch in the flame. The paper burned, with some difficulty, being thick and heavy, but Mr. Autry persisted until the last vestige had been reduced to ashes. "'If you had presented that dispatch to the man to whom it is addressed,' he said to Bethune, "'you would never have seen your home and friends again. You don't know what a devil Doyle is.' He paused and looked at Mr. Sanders with a peculiar smile. "'And I am worse. A hundred times worse.' "'Doyle and I are trying to make a record in the Secret Service,' Autry continued, "'and we seized on the opportunity offered by Mr. Lincoln's desire to get a dangerous woman off his hands. "'But for the President, the woman would be in the old Capitol prison at this moment, "'but he heard of her arrest and sent for her. "'He desired to send her south under the escort of an officer, "'but the woman declared that she wouldn't trust herself to the care of any enemy of her country. "'Mrs. Lincoln, who is a Southern woman, understood the situation from that standpoint.' and sympathized with the demand. Yes, demand. You wouldn't think a woman who was in prison a few weeks ago with evidence enough against her to send her to the gallows would be bold enough to make demands, but that is just what has happened. Well, there ain't no accounting for the women, remarked Mr. Sanders. Do you know who this woman is? inquired Autry, turning to Bethune. I have not the slightest idea, was the reply. Up here she calls herself Estelle Brandon, but at home she is known as Mrs. Elise Clopton. "'My aunt?' cried Bethune, the blood rushing to his face. "'The same,' said Autry, with a smile. "'Well, if you'd have given me three guesses, I'd have call her name,' exclaimed Mr. Sanders. "'It's most like knowing folks' handwriting. "'I'll tell you it's a solemn truth, Waldron,' Mr. Sanders went on gravely. "'For a omen that's got a heap of sense, Lee's Clopton is the biggest fool that ever trod shoe leather. "'I don't reckon I ought to talk that away, but it's the naked truth. "'I've got a right to say it, too, because I'd knock down and drag out anybody else that said it outside the family.' Fool she is, I'm mighty fond of Lee's. Bethune made a grimace. I don't like her much, but I'm glad I came. I hope her experience will take some of the silly romance out of her head. Shucks, you couldn't get it out of her unless you changed her head. I bet you right now she thinks she's done wonders, remarked Mr. Sanders. <laughs> That's true, said Mr. Autry, laughing. She thinks she is quite a heroine. All of a sudden his manner changed. Come, we've been here too long. They're expecting me to carry you to headquarters, and some of the boys will come here pretty soon to see what's the matter. We have no time to waste. I'll take you to Mr. Lincoln at once. After that, you'll be safe. He hustled around with a great display of energy, and seemed to be really anxious and uneasy. Mr. Sanders, who had developed a copious supply of what he called good healthy suspicion, put several questions to Mr. Autry. The latter finally handed Mr. Sanders a loaded pistol. Take this, he said, and if things don't go to suit you, put a ball through my head. "'All right, Waldron, so be it. I'll do as you say,' Mr. Sanders remarked in a tone of relief. Autry ordered a carriage, and in a very few minutes they were on their way to the White House. The hour was not late, and when they arrived there was considerable bustle about the doors. Congressmen were coming and going, and big bugs, as Mr. Sanders expressed it, of various degrees of importance were moving to and fro. There seemed to be some difficulty about seeing Mr. Lincoln, but Autry would not be denied. He was as pompous and as imperious in his demand to be shown into Mr. Lincoln's office as any member of the cabinet could have been. He sent a card in and followed the messenger to the very door. He had written on the card, In regard to the branding case, 
and presently someone came out and conducted the three through a side door into the private room to which Mr. Lincoln retired when he was troubled or had a fit of melancholy that somehow went hand in hand with him until his unfortunate taking off. A fire was burning on the hearth, and the three callers sat in silence while waiting for Mr. Lincoln to make his appearance. They waited a long time, as it seemed to Bethune and Mr. Sanders, and even when the door opened and a tall man with tousled black hair came into the room. He was followed by a thick-set, quick-spoken person whose features were almost entirely concealed by a heavy beard and spectacles with wide glasses. "'But, Mr. President,' said this person, with a show of indignation, "'you will ruin the discipline of the army if you go on reprieving deserters. Why, this case is a most flagrant one.' "'Oh, yes, I know all about that. But he's a mere lad. Why, he's not more than twenty-two. He got tired and hungry and homesick. Why, when his mother came in this morning and told me the facts, I didn't let her finish.' I said, hold on, madam, you've said enough. I know all about the case. I've been in your son's shoes a hundred times. But Mr. President, interposed the other. But Mr. Secretary, interrupted the president, you forget that every soldier in the Union Army is a free-born American citizen. We can't afford to hang American citizens because they get homesick and heart-heavy. You remind me of a fellow I once heard of in Kentucky. But before the president could point the moral with a story, Mr. Secretary had whipped indignantly out of the room, slamming the door behind him with no show of respect whatever. The three visitors had arisen from their chairs when Mr. Lincoln entered the room, and at least two of them regarded him with interest and curiosity as he came slouching toward them with a chuckle. "'These gentlemen, Mr. President, have come in regard to the Brandon case,' said Mr. Autry, introducing the two Georgians. "'You forwarded a pass through me, if you remember. Mr. Bethune accepted the commission, and Mr. Sanders—' "'Well, Mr. President, I just come on my own hook, as the little boy said about the cow in the garden,' Mr. Sanders hastened to say. "'Take seats, all of you,' remarked Mr. Lincoln, cordially. Then he turned to Mr. Sanders. "'What about the little boy and the cow?' "'Why, one Sunday a little boy was set to mind a gap in the garden fence. A panel had blown down in the night, and it couldn't be mended on account of Sunday. So the little boy was set to mind it. When the folks got home from church, the cow was in the garden, and the little boy was sitting on the doorstep sniffling. His mammy says—' "'Why, honey, what in the world is the matter? "'The garden is ruined. How did the cow get in?' "'She run her horns under my jacket and flung me a somerset,' says the little boy. "'I see,' says his daddy. "'She got in on her own hook. "'The daddy had thought he got off a good joke, "'but nobody seed the two pints, "'and this made him so mad that he went in the house "'and loaded his gun with a piece of fat bacon "'and fired it right at the cow's hindquarters. "'She curled her tail and run off smoking. "'They say you could smell fried meat in the neighborhood for the longest.' Mr. Lincoln clasped his hands behind his head and laughed a hearty, contented laugh. Mr. Autry regarded Mr. Sanders with a puzzled expression. "'Did you say the joke had two points?' he asked. "'Why, certain and sure,' responded Mr. Sanders, with alacrity. "'You've seen cows, maybe, with no horns, but you've never seen one made like a rhinosaurus. At this, Mr. Lincoln laughed unrestrainedly. Whatever reserve the shadow of care and trouble had cast over him when he entered the room had been driven entirely away— and his visitors had a very close and intimate view of the real Lincoln, the man of the people. At last, when it seemed time for them to go, Mr. Autry remarked, The reason I took the liberty of bringing these gentlemen here was that some of Mr. Stanton's men were preparing to arrest them. You did exactly right, said Mr. Lincoln emphatically. I'm willing for Stanton to have his fingers in all the pies, if you'll let me break the crust in places. Well, at the pace he's going, he'll soon have the whole thing in his own hands, remarked Mr. Autry. "'The whole thing, as you call it,' replied Mr. Lincoln, leveling a searching glance at the young man, "'couldn't be in better hands. "'I'm told every day that Mr. Stanton has small respect for the President, "'and I reckon that's so, but the President is willing to rock along on a small allowance of respect "'when he's getting a steady supply of the kind of work Stanton is doing day and night.' "'That's so,' remarked Mr. Sanders judiciously. "'Was Mr. Stanton the man that followed you in here?' "'Receiving an affirmative answer, Mr. Sanders went on. "'I allowed so from his walk and talk.' but the way you played with him put me in mind of the feller and his trained dog. How was that? asked Mr. Lincoln, leaning back in his chair and twisting his long legs together in most curious fashion. Every trace of fatigue and worry had vanished from his face. Well, it was like this. A feller down our way had a hound dog that he thought was the finest pup in all creation. He was good for foxes, good for minks, good for rabbits, good for coons, and especially for possums. Naturally, the feller was constant a bragging on the dog. Well, one day the feller had company at his house. The dog was lying in a corner of the fireplace, and presently the feller got to bragging on him. He said the dog was both trained and domesticated. That dog, he says to his company, will do anything in the world I tell him to do. 
The company sorter doubted about it, and the feller ups and says, Rover, get up from there and go out of here. Rover, hearing his name, hit the floor a lick or two with his tail and draped off to sleep again. The feller hollered a little louder. Rover, don't you hear? Get up from there and go out of here. Rover got up, looked at the feller like he thought he was crazy, and sneaked under the bed. Well, the company laughed considerable, but the feller stuck to his statements. Says he, there's a mighty good understanding between me and Rover. He knows when I'm playing, and besides, he's a plum hurricane when it comes to running coops up a tree. Mr. Lincoln laughed and looked at Mr. Sanders with a quizzical expression. Just then, there came a rap on the door. The president arose, made two long strides across the room, and threw the door open. Mr. President, I heard something a while ago, and I think you should be told about it, said the newcomer excitedly. Well, what is it? Why, when Mr. Stanton went out just now, I heard him say you were a damned fool. Did you hear him say it? Mr. Lincoln asked. Yes, Mr. President, I heard with my own ears. Well, if Stanton said that, I reckon there must be something in it. He usually knows what he's talking about. I thought you had some news for me. Good heavens, Mr. President, exclaimed the person at the door. Yes, said Mr. Lincoln solemnly. Good heavens and good night. Bethune sat with clenched hands. He could hardly believe what he had heard. He was dazed. He drew a long breath, arose from his chair, and took a quick turn around the room. Mr. Lincoln observed the young man's excitement. He paused before he seated himself, and turned to Bethune with a smile that did not drive away the expression of sadness which had returned to his face. "'What would happen if one of Mr. Davis's advisers should make a similar statement?' he asked. Bethune replied with gleaming eyes. "'Mr. President, the man who heard the remark would knock the scoundrel down and afterward call him out. "'I reckon that's so. Mr. Davis has more close friends than I have,' remarked Mr. Lincoln with a sigh. He seated himself and closed his eyes. "'It ain't so much being friends,' said Mr. Sanders somewhat cheerfully, though in his honest Georgia heart he deeply pitied the President, and understood why he was lonely and sometimes melancholy. "'It ain't so much being friends, it's because we're all in high hosses down yon from daybreak till bedtime.' "'Well, I wish—' Mr. Lincoln paused and looked in the fire. Mr. Sanders seized the remark and finished it. "'You wish someone to get on a high horse for you. Well, sir, if at any time I'm around, and any of your fellers begin for you to give you too much lip, just turn around to me and say, "'Friend Sanders, what do you think of the state of the country and the craps in general?' You say them words, Mr. President, and if I don't make the feller say his prayers to you, you may call me a humbug. Down our way they say you're a Yankee, but if that's so, the woods is full of Yankees in Georgia, all born and raised right there. Mr. Lincoln laughed with real enjoyment. <laughs> you're paying me the highest compliment I have had in many a day, he said. But we can't sit here palavering all night. He tapped a bell and a messenger appeared. See if the ladies have gone to bed. Word soon came back that the ladies were taking a light refreshment and would the president join them. "'I want you gentlemen to see what sort of a job you have undertaken,' Mr. Lincoln remarked dryly. "'I can manage a mule or a steer pretty well, but not a willful woman.' "'Amen!' exclaimed Mr. Sanders with unction. The president led the way, followed by Bethune and Mr. Sanders, Mr. Autry saying he would wait for their return. Before they reached the room where the ladies were, the laughter and chatter of Elise Clopton could be heard. She was in high glee— Francis Bethune never knew until that hour why he disliked his aunt. It was the uncertainty and absurdity of her temperament. One moment she was taking herself more seriously than a heroine of romance, the next she had plunged head foremost into, well, into inconsequence. She was as truly herself here, practically a prisoner, as if she had been at once queen and housemaid. She had met Bethune's uncle by accident while he was passing through Washington on his way to Harvard. She, herself, was on her way to a young lady school in Baltimore. Neither one of them got any farther. The result of half an hour's conversation, while waiting for the train to leave, was an elopement. In a year or two her husband was dead, but her bereavement had not sobered Elise. At thirty-five she was still as beautiful and as lacking in judgment as when a miss of sixteen. When Bethune and Mr. Sanders were ushered into the room, Elise clapped her hands together as the soubrettes do on the stage, gave a smothered scream, supposed to represent joy, and fell upon Francis Bethune and kissed him until he wished himself well out of the uncomfortable position. Francis, she cried, allow me to present you to my dear, dear friend, Mrs. Lincoln. My nephew, Mrs. Lincoln, and here is Mr. Sanders. Oh, you dear good man, you make me feel quite at home. Mrs. Lincoln, this is my dear old friend, Mr. Sanders. Are both of you prisoners, too? Oh, isn't it glorious to suffer for one's country? Bethune looked at Mr. Lincoln. The president was standing with his hands clasped behind him. He was not smiling, but there was a comical expression on his face. 
Mrs. Lincoln was laughing unrestrainedly, and it was very evident to Bethune that the lady of the White House had found Elise Clopton sufficiently amusing. His irritation was such that he could scarcely refrain from showing it in words. Youngster as he was, it seemed to him that the whole South was here on exhibition in the person of his frivolous aunt. He was on the point of saying something regrettable, when Mr. Sanders stepped in as it were. "'You don't look like you've been suffering for your country much. Appearances is mighty deceiving if you ain't been having three square meals a day, fried meat and biscuit and hot coffee for breakfast, collards and dumplings and buttermilk for dinner, and ash cake and molasses for supper.' "'You see how the men mistake us,' protested Elise, turning to Mrs. Lincoln. "'Our keenest anguish is mental. "'But the men never think they are suffering unless they are in physical pain. "'And the men think the women are too timid to take any risks. "'Look at me, Mr. Sanders.' "'I see you, Elise,' said Mr. Sanders, so dryly that Mrs. Lincoln burst out laughing. "'Don't mind him, dear friend. "'He always was comical. "'And then there was your grandmother, Mr. Sanders, Nancy Hart. "'Didn't she suffer for her country?' She stayed at home and hit the Tories a lick when they pestered her, two for one, maybe. But she didn't complain of no suffering, so far as I know. The suffering was all with them that pestered her. Anyhow, we've come to take you home, and when we get there, I'm going to build a pen to keep you in. Goodness knows I don't want to be running my head in no more hornet's nest. Why, you don't call this a hornet's nest, I hope, said Mrs. Lincoln, smiling. By no manner of means, mum, replied Mr. Sanders with a bow. This is the only home-like place I've struck since I left Shady Dale. But I hear you're a southerner, and Mr. Lincoln is a Georgie all over, and that accounts for it. If we weren't here, where'd we be? Well, we'll go back now and talk about Georgia, said Mr. Lincoln. Tomorrow or the next day we'll arrange about the lady's journey home. Yes, I am willing to go now, said Elise dramatically. I have performed my duty. I've risked my life for my native Southland. If you only knew what a close call it was, you'd doubtless be prouder still, I reckon, remarked Mr. Lincoln with a smile. With that, Bethune and Mr. Sanders bade the ladies good night and followed the president to his private office, where Waldron Autry awaited them. They were for returning to the hotel at once, as the hour was growing late, but Mr. Lincoln would not hear to it unless they were willing to admit that they were tired of his company. There were nights, he said, when sleep fitted away from his neighborhood and refused to be coaxed back, and this, he thought, would prove to be one of those nights. First he wrote out a new certificate for Francis Bethune, as well as a document to ensure the safety of Mr. Sanders, and then he began to talk about Georgia sure enough, addressing his conversation mainly to Mr. Sanders, whose comments he appeared thoroughly to enjoy. He asked about the people, their views and hopes. Once he declared that if the people of the South knew his intentions and desires as well as he did himself, he believed they would put an end to the war and come back into the Union. "'But what about the politicians?' calmly inquired Mr. Sanders. "'That's a fact,' exclaimed Mr. Lincoln." the politicians and the editors. We have them here, too. Oh, I was just telling you of a dream I once had. And then again you're an abolitionist, Mr. President, said Mr. Sanders. Well, that matter has been settled, so far as I can settle it. But up to a few months ago, that question was a mere matter of moonshine compared to the Union. I said as much to Horace Greeley, and he and his friends had a good many duck fits about it. All the government doors have big keyholes except Stanton's. Well, abolitionism was a great question, but it was small compared with the preservation of the Union. All other political questions are small by the side of that. They talked until some time after midnight, with occasional interruptions from messengers connected with the War Department or with some of the committees of Congress. Once Mr. Lincoln, after receiving a telegram, held it open in his hand, and was silent a long time. Finally he folded it lengthwise many times, and then wrapped it around his forefinger, holding it in place with his thumb. "'It has got so now,' he said, breaking the silence." that I can tell by the rumble of the wheels, whether the man in the carriage is fetching good news or bad. The President made no remark about the contents of the telegram, but he fell into such a state of abstraction that Bethune nodded to the others, and simultaneously they all arose and bade him good night. He no longer urged them to stay, but asked them to return early the next day, saying that he wanted to have a good long talk with friend Sanders. When Bethune and Mr. Sanders went to breakfast the next morning, they were escorted to a table at which sat John Omohundro, who saluted them in the most familiar manner. Bethune, whose temperament lacked that off-hand heartiness which is sometimes attractive and sometimes repelling, bowed coldly. Mr. Sanders, who was heartiness itself on almost every occasion, smiled vacantly at Omohundro, remarking, "'I have seed your face, Summers, I really do believe.' "'Why, certainly,' said Omohundro in his drawling voice. "'I have travelled with you from Albany to New York.' "'That's so!' exclaimed Mr. Sanders. 
you're the feller that helped the omen's baby while she give it castor isle. Well, you're a mighty handy man, but I've been in such a buzz and racket and seed so many folks that I'd never unknowed you again. They talked on indifferent subjects until the meal had been dispatched, and then they sat in the reading room of the hotel and talked business. What about your program? inquired Omohundro. It's foolhardy, but I'm willing to go into it on conditions. I mean this kidnapping business. It's as easy as falling off a log, replied Bethune. Lots easier, remarked Sanders. But now you're beginning to say something. But, but how are you going to get away? You don't know a step of the road. How are you going to get Mr. Lincoln safely to the south? Trust to luck, I reckon, replied Bethune. What I was trying to say when you jumped in betwixt me and my words was that the job is easy, but to be a pity to put it through. You've said something again, remarked Omohundro. Mr. Lincoln has the hardest time of any human being I ever saw. He reminds me of my father. He puts me in mind of all the good men I've ever knowed. He takes them all in, said Mr. Sanders. He's a good deal like you, Bethune declared. Well, I wish to the Lord I was more like him, said Mr. Sanders solemnly. I'll tell you what, fellers, that man has looked troubled in the eyes so long that he pities everybody in the world but himself. Frank, I'll go into this business if you'll let me do the engineering, if you'll put it in my hands. Oh, I've no objection to that, <laughs> assented Bethune with a short laugh. He's so different from what I expected. By George, don't you believe it would break his heart to be taken away from here? Mr. Sanders pursed up his mouth and looked at the ceiling. No, oh, 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 twouldn't break his heart, he announced after some reflection. He's a good strong man, and from the look he has in his eye, he's seen so much trouble that he's ready to shake hands with it whatever he meets it, knowing pretty well that he'll get some fun out in it somehow or somewheres. You leave it to me, Frank, leave it to me. Well, said Omohundro, if it's to be done, tomorrow night is the time, between ten and twelve, the nearer ten the better. Mr. Stanton usually calls about half-past twelve or one. Mr. Lincoln may ask you to stay to supper. If he does, say yes and thank you too. If you take supper here, a carriage will be waiting for you at the door. If there is more than one vehicle near the hotel entrance, the driver on your carriage will say, Whoa, Billy. If you don't take supper here, the carriage will drive into the White House grounds precisely at ten o'clock. The driver of the carriage will stay with it until he hears pursuers, or until you meet another conveyance in the road driven by a country chap. If you are pursued, one of you must be on the driver's seat to take the lines when my man retires, and then you'll have to take the consequences and get out the best way you can. I tell you candidly, I don't see how you are going to get out with the president, and but for orders from Captain McCarthy, I wouldn't make a move in it. I'm fond of Mr. Lincoln. I feel like he's kin to me. Well, there are bigger principles at issue than kinfolks and presidents, remarked Bethune with some emphasis. That's so, assented Mr. Sanders, but I wish from my heart he was more like some of the other presidents we have had in North America. Good night, said Omohundro. We may never see one another again. I'm going to help you out all I can, but I can't say that I wish for your success. Nor me, neither, commented Mr. Sanders. The next day found Bethune and Mr. Sanders at the White House. While Mr. Lincoln was busy, they walked around the grounds with Elise Clopton. They were not in a very gay humor, as may well be supposed, and it was a relief to their minds to listen to the lady's chatter. She related her experiences from the time she left Shady Dale to visit her family in Maryland, and if her reports were correct, she had been through many daring adventures. She was quite a heroine in her own estimation, and there is no doubt that, frivolous and giddy as she was, she possessed both courage and presence of mind. Mr. Stanton paid her a high tribute when he told Mr. Lincoln that she was quite the most dangerous and daring spy that had operated around Washington, and he wanted to make an example of her. As Mr. Sanders remarked on more than one occasion, there were good points about the lady if you didn't have to live on the same lot with her. Curiously enough, she had conceived a romantic friendship for Mr. Lincoln. "'Isn't he the dearest man?' she said to her companions as they strolled about, enjoying the warm sunshine. "'I think he is just grand. I am dead in love with him. Oh, he is the most fascinating human being I ever saw. I used to hate him, clasping her hands and throwing her head back, and now I love him. How can our newspapers abuse him as they do?' Presently Tad, Mr. Lincoln's little son, came from the rear of the house with his goats, and was soon joined by his father, who was assiduous in his attentions to the lad. Elise wanted to go where they were. "'Now, Elise, don't let's make geese of ourselves,' said Mr. Sanders. "'The man hardly has time to speak to his family. Let him alone.' "'Oh, don't you believe that,' said Elise. "'Why, he's the most devoted man to his family I ever saw. He allows them to impose on him right and left. It's perfectly grand to see how patient he is. And look at that child's clothes.' 
See what a misfit they are. It's the fashion, I reckon, responded Mr. Sanders. Elise laughed merrily. Ha, 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 the fashion. Why, the world never saw such a fashion as that. Well, a president and his family don't have to be in the fashion. When it comes to that, they're mighty nigh as independent as me, I reckon. The president heard Elise Clopton laugh, and seeing Bethune and Mr. Sanders with her, joined the group, Tad following with his horned team. You seem to be worried this morning, Mr. Lincoln, said Elise with one of her brightest smiles. Yes. We all have to worry about something at some time or another, replied the president. There's a man down in Tennessee they are trying to hang, because he wandered off from camp one night, and his mother's at this end of the line crying her eyes out. I have spent half the morning trying to get a dispatch to the officer in command. Before they hang or shoot the boy, I want to see the record. <sighs> but it's all right now, he said with a sigh. They walked a little in silence. Finally, Mr. Lincoln turned to Mr. Sanders. Does your president have much opposition? Not among them that he can get his hands on, but Joe Brown is after him with a sharp stick, and Bob Toombs is around, and they manage to keep the water warm, if not a bilin'. The state's rights plaster does pretty well when you slap it on someone else, but when the other fellow slaps it onto you, it burns like fire. How is that? Mr. Lincoln asked, his eyes fairly dancing with amusement. Well, Jeff Davis was put in to slap the state's rights plaster onto you all, and now you can hardly get a law passed, but what Joe Brown bobs up with the state's rights plaster and slaps it onto Mr. Davis? Mr. Lincoln roared with laughter. I don't think it's fair, Mr. Sanders went on, but some of the boys apparently get a good deal of fun out in it. The president's unrestrained laughter attracted the attention of Tad, who left his goats to the temporary care of Elise and went running to Mr. Sanders. I wish you'd stay here all the time, he said in a pleading tone. What for, I'd like to know, inquired Mr. Sanders, lifting the lad in his strong arms. Because you make Papa laugh, replied Tad. He laughs that way with me sometimes, but I want to hear him laugh that way when he's with grown people. That puts me in mind of the little chap that wanted a candy elephant, said Mr. Sanders. He worried about it so till his pappy sent off and bought a dollar's worth of sugar, and his mammy put it in the preserve kettle, poured in a couple of gourdfuls of water, and stewed it down, and then, after so long a time, took it out, pulled it the best she could, and then built it up into some kind of animal that a blind man might take to be a rough imitation of a wooden elephant. Then she called him the little chap, and turned the elephant over to him. Well, he took this elephant out of the woodshed and started in on him, but he had not his way no further than one of the hind legs till he was the sickest boy you ever saw. And after that he'd turn pale and cry if anybody so much as said candy elephant to him. <laughs> and no wonder, exclaimed Tad. That's a fact, responded Mr. Sanders. No wonder. And I wouldn't be here a week before your pappy would pull out his handkerchief and cry if he be so much as heard the name of Sanders. Would you? cried Tad, turning to his father. Why, certainly not, replied the president. Satisfied, the lad slipped from Mr. Sanders' arms and went skipping to his goats. "'I'll tell you the truth, my friend,' Mr. Lincoln went on, laying a familiar hand on Mr. Sanders' shoulder. "'You have no idea what a joyous relief it is to meet a man who knows how to say things, and who doesn't want a post office for himself, or his wife's cousin, or who doesn't want to take command of all the armies in the field, or take entire charge of the government, or who hasn't some complaint to make or some objection to offer. Why?' It's like seeing the sun again after a couple of months of rainy weather. I reckon it's worse now than ever before, remarked Mr. Sanders. They were walking along together, Bethune having lagged behind, intent on his own reflections. Yes, I reckon it is, said Mr. Lincoln. If it wasn't for Stanton, who likes to have his hand in everything, I don't know what I'd do. He can stand up to more hard work and worry than any man I ever saw. Now, if you had a machine full of intelligence that was greedy for all the work you could pour into the hopper, you wouldn't mind it much if it pinched your fingers once in a while, or took off a fingernail now and then, would you? I just reckon not, responded Mr. Sanders, with emphasis. Well, that is the reason I take no offense when Stanton cusses me out behind my back, or when he cuts up his capers before my face. I see, said Mr. Sanders. When you want to bluff some feller that's a little too smart, you fetch out Stanton. It puts me in mind, in some ways, of Roach's race hoss. How is that? Mr. Lincoln inquired. Why, there was a young chap in our settlement by the name of Waters, and he had a quarter hoss that he vowed and declared could outrun anything on four legs, including a steam engine. Well, he bragged about his hoss and went on, so that one day, old man Johnny Roach, who had about a thimbleful too much of dram, up and said he had a racer that could beat Waters' hoss so fur that he'd turn and meet him halfway coming back. Waters banted him for a bet in a trial, and he got both. They set the day, and when the time come, Waters was there with his pony, and presently Uncle Johnny's youngest boy come galloping up on a steer. Now, everybody in the country knowed the steer— he was old as the hills, but he was game, and his horns was a plum curiosity. From the pint of one to the pint of t'other was mighty nigh nine feet, and he had a way of shaking him that made folks stand round. 
Waters began to take water right off. Says he, that ain't no hoss. I never said he was a hoss, says old man Johnny. I said he was a racer. Well, he ain't no racer, says Waters. That's yet to be decided, says Johnny Roach. The money's up, says he, and I'm going to walk off with it. Waters hummed and hawed, but it didn't do no good. Get ready, says old man Roach. Some of you men give the word. Well, says Waters, I don't know whether your steer can run or not. Be to get back, he's liable to do some damage, and I'll not run my hoss again him. So Roach's boy rode the steer over the course, and old man Johnny pulled off home with the stakes in his pocket. Mr. Lincoln seemed to enjoy this anecdote very much. He said there was very pungent morale in it, which could be given a variety of applications, and he forthwith added it to his already large collection of stories. All this while Bethune was wandering about the lawn with head hung down like a boy with the pouts. He was thinking hard, and his thoughts were not pleasant ones. Nan Dorrington gazed at him through the mists of memory with sad eyes. Of the many familiar faces he could remember, only one seemed to wear a smile, and that was the face of Miss Puella Gillum. Bethune came to Washington, it will be remembered, to seize and carry off the president. He had in fact hit upon the only plan which was in the least likely to paralyze the North, bring about peace, and establish the Confederacy. Though the Georgian was a young man, he had tolerably fair judgment, and he had already seen that this patient, kindly man, with a bright smile and sad eyes, melancholy at one elbow and mirth at the other, was the sole mainstay and reliance of the vast machine that was carrying on the war. That, but for his provision intact, the halls of the capital and the corridors of the departments would swarm with relentless and ruinous factions. It was true that Bethune's head was full of romantic notions. He had descended from a chivalrous race, and had been reared in a region where chivalry and knightly courtesy were very real things to those who aspired to them, and he now felt himself pulled about by conflicting emotions. He was keen to perform some feat or accomplish some result that would advance the southern cause, and here was the opportunity. And yet, the bare idea of carrying it out left a bad taste in his mouth. He was at war with himself. He felt, in a dim, vague way, that the president was the heart of a mystery, the center of a wonderful problem. As in an old picture, a light from some unseen source appeared to fall on the worn face of this man, who, born with the wolf at the door, and in the most abject surroundings, had been lifted up to guide the nation. Bethune had been so wrapped up in his own reflections that his Aunt Elise could hardly make him hear when she called him. He lifted his head inside, and then a frown fell on his face as he realized that she was speaking to him. Her frivolity irritated him. Her gushing volubility oppressed him. <laughs> Frank, oh, Frank, she called laughing. Pray stop thinking about your sweetheart and come with me. The president told me I was not to go outside the gates, but I'm going now just to see what he'll say. Won't you come with me? For answer, Bethune turned sharply away from his aunt. She ran after him. Don't be so cross, Frank, she cried. It's not becoming to you. I wasn't going at all. Do be pleasant. You and old Billy Sanders between you will cause the people here to think I have no standing in my own family. Both of you are very rude. What have I done to deserve it? This last remark was spoken with some show of temper, for the beautiful Elise could be spiteful at times. Nothing, Aunt Elise, replied Bethune, but in your position a little more dignity would be suitable. Elise laughed loudly, but her face was red with indignation. Ha! A professor of etiquette, she cried. Before you try to teach me etiquette, nephew, do learn to be polite and agreeable. Mr. Lincoln, talking with Mr. Sanders some distance away, noticed by the actions of Bethune and his aunt that something was wrong. What's the matter with our young friends, he asked. They seem to be quarreling. Well, it's a family fuss, I reckon, replied Mr. Sanders. Frank was never fond of Lee's, nor she of him. The lady seems to be somewhat flighty, remarked the president. But I've remarked the symptoms in so many charming women that I rarely notice it now. Mr. Sanders pursed his lips as a country lawyer does when he is about to make some remark which he thinks is unusually profound. Lise is about as good as the common run, I reckon. She's not nigh as flighty as she looks to be. A right smart of it is put on, same as her clothes. When you come to know her, she's got a lot of good pints. Well, all her gabble she never tells all she knows. I don't like her much, but I don't know but what that's my fault. Likely enough it is, said the president. I've had a great opportunity to find out what people think of me. Nine out of ten misjudge or misunderstand my words, my actions, and my motives. You should be president for a little while, friend Sanders, just for the fun of the thing. Me, exclaimed Mr. Sanders. Would I have to have a secretary of war? Why, certainly. That's a part of the game. Well, you'll have to excuse me. I don't mind taking a turn at checkers or marbles or mumblepeg, but that's about the limits of my appetite. No, sir. 
No plain president for me if there's a secretary of war in the game. I may have to tousle you before I leave this town. If I do and it don't hurt your feelings too much, I am to make a clean, healthy job of it. Mr. Lincoln laughed and excused himself. A great many people had passed them by, going to the White House, some on business, some moved by curiosity, and some impelled by interest and sympathy. "'It takes a heap of people to make a world, friend Sanders,' said the President, as he turned away, "'and I must go and examine some more of the specimens. When you get ready to come in, Miss Brandon, I mean Mrs. Clopton, will show you how to avoid the crowd.' "'I hope,' he said, pausing again, "'that you'll take dinner with us. Maybe you'd prefer to call it supper. About what time, Mr. President?' "'Early candlelight,' replied Mr. Lincoln with a twinkle in his eye. The phrase was so familiar that the Georgian took it as a matter of course. "'Any gal company?' inquired Mr. Sanders. "'No, I think not. Mrs. Lincoln will have some of her friends to dine with her, and we can have a snug little dinner of our own. We'll have a member of Congress who was in Georgia once upon a time, and Stanton threatens to come, too. Well, I don't know about Frank Bethune, but none of them can turn my stomach.' "'Stanton says he wants to discover whether you are fish, flesh, or fowl,' remarked the President, smiling. "'Just tell him I'm a plain old snapping turtle from Georgia, with red eyes and cold feet.' Mr. Lincoln turned away laughing, and Mr. Sanders was left alone until little Tad came along driving his goats. He fell into conversation with Mr. Sanders, and the talk was so interesting to both of them that they sat flat on the grass. They went from one subject to another until Mr. Sanders, who was a famous hand with young ones, "'landed Tad in the midst of that wonderful collection of animal stories "'with which southern children have been familiar for many generations. "'The old Georgian told them so simply, "'and with such apparent confidence in their reality, "'that the little son of the president accepted them as facts "'and was, for the time being, in another world, "'the world that had been created by the Negro romancers "'who lived long ago. "'Great statesmen passed and repassed them "'as they sat or lay reclining on the grass. "'Generals of the army,' Congressmen, civilians, office seekers, a curious and motley throng, formed part of the procession, but so far as Mr. Sanders and Tad were concerned, they were all phantoms, invisible to the eye. Bethune and his aunt were soon on good terms again, and they made their way slowly back to the White House, evidently thinking that Mr. Sanders had gone in. Presently a servant came out hunting for Tad. "'We have been searching for you everywhere,' the man said. "'Your lunch is ready.' "'Lunch!' cried Tad." He had been brought out of Fableland so suddenly that he could hardly realize his surroundings. "'Won't you come?' he said to Mr. Sanders with appealing eyes. "'Please? Oh, please come.' "'No, I reckon I'd better wait for you out here, or in the pen where they put the office hunters,' said Mr. Sanders. "'We have some extra fine soup, sir,' remarked the servant by way of a suggestion. When Mr. Sanders had been made perfectly sure that whatever pleased the child would be pleasing to his father and mother— he took Tad's hand, and together they went to the children's lunchroom. It is doubtful if Tad ever had another such day. The fun, for him, began when he made a somewhat riotous protest against a bib. "'Don't you wear him?' inquired Mr. Sanders in tones of surprise. "'Well, I allers do,' he turned to the waiter. "'I wished you'd pin one around my neck. I don't feel right with alm. Then, with a napkin on, he made believe to be a little boy, and he carried out the pretense so solemnly that Tad fairly screamed with laughter. In fact, the youngster reached the point where he'd laugh almost to exhaustion every time Mr. Sanders looked at him. Mrs. Lincoln, hearing this unusual sound, left her guests for a moment and peeped in the door. For an instant she couldn't realize the situation. Mr. Sanders was saying, "'What's your name?' and Tad was telling him. To which the reply was, "'Well, I'm named Little Billy, and I want some syrup in my plate so I can sop it.' As Tad could say nothing for laughing, Mr. Sanders went on. One time I was eating a chicken gizzard, and I got to laughing, and the first thing anybody knowed the gizzard was stuck in my goozle. My mammy seed I was choking, and she hit me a lick on the back as hard as a mule can kick, and the gizzard flew out and knocked the cruet stand off on the table. This made me laugh, and my mammy says, "'Supposing you'd have been gnawing on the whole chicken, where'd you be now?' And I says, "'Humph, you better ax where the chicken be.' This was too much for Tad. He slid out of his chair and fell on the floor where he fairly screamed with laughter." The dignified waiter caught the contagion somehow. He turned his back upon the rest and leaned half-bent against the wall, trying to hold his sides with one arm. Mrs. Lincoln ran back to relate the episode to her guests, and in her efforts to tell of the scene she witnessed, her laughter became uncontrollable, and pretty soon she and her guests were in a state bordering on the hysterical. 
all except one, an elderly lady, the wife of a cabinet minister, who sat looking from one to the other with eyebrows lifted and a countenance expressive of contempt. This lady seized upon this unpropitious moment to take her departure, and the gravity of her demeanor as she bowed herself out was such as to give new cause for laughter. The finishing touch was given when Mrs. Lincoln, who had a keen eye for the ridiculous, so far succeeded in controlling her countenance as to give a swift imitation of the solemn exit of the lady who had retired. This last incident, as free from malice as an innocent caper of a schoolgirl, was duly reported to the cabinet minister's wife, and that lady made it her business from that time forth to spread abroad hints of Mrs. Lincoln's flightiness, and out of these hints, so industriously planted, grew the thousand and one fictions that were scattered up and down the land in regard to the mental condition of this bright lady of the White House. That evening at dinner, after Bethune and Mr. Sanders had been introduced to Mr. Stanton and to Congressman Hudspeth, Mr. Lincoln referred to Tad's enjoyable luncheon, an enthusiastic account of which the lad had already given his father. Mr. Sanders made some humorous remarks on the subject of amusing children. For a time the talk was wholly between these two. Mr. Stanton seemed to be absorbed, though he watched the two Southerners very closely, while Hudspeth's thoughts appeared to be far afield. Finally, Mr. Sanders turned to Mr. Hudspeth and asked him if he had ever been to Georgia. Yes, I had some peculiar as well as some very pleasant experiences there. I allowed I met you there. You lived with Addison Abercrombie, remarked Mr. Sanders. You needn't be ashamed of it, he went on, for Mr. Seward was a school teacher down in that neighborhood years ago. Well, I wonder, exclaimed Mr. Lincoln. Stanton, the governor, has never told us about that. Well, well, I mind him well, Mr. Sanders continued. He was as thin as a rail with a big nose, and his Adam's apple stuck out like a pot leg. He had red hair and a freckled face. Mr. Hudspeth asked about little Crotchet, who was dead, and about Aaron the Arab, in regard to whom Mr. Sanders volunteered the information that he now owned the Abercrombie place. "'What nonsense!' exclaimed Mr. Stanton, almost angrily. "'I mean, sir,' exclaimed Mr. Sanders with a deprecatory gesture, "'that Aaron is by the Abercrombie place like some folks I've seen are about the government. He thinks he owns it, and he don't. They think they're running the government, and they ain't.' Mr. Stanton swelled up like a gobbler, as Mr. Sanders described it afterward, but Mr. Lincoln came to the rescue. Laughing heartily, he cried, Ha, 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 a fair hit, friend Sanders. You've touched my weak point. I reckon I do put on too many airs. Mr. Sanders had a remark ready, but he felt his foot pressed, and he held his peace. At that moment, Mr. Stanton addressed him. Who gave you a commission to come here? A fellow named Doyle. It was Bethune who answered, and not Mr. Sanders. Doyle gave me a pass from Mr. Lincoln. I regarded it as an invitation. And so it was, said Mr. Lincoln. Who invited you, inquired the secretary, turning his spectacles on Mr. Sanders. Well, I'm like the stranger at the inn fair. The folks saw him hang around the door, and some of them asked him what he was doing there, and he said, says he, I heard the fiddlin' and the shufflin', and smelt the dram, and I just thought I'd look on and see well done done well. Well, you may say that you had an invitation, too, remarked Mr. Lincoln. I wouldn't have missed knowing you for a good deal. I can vouch for that, said Mr. Stanton ironically. If you can, Mr. Secretary, so much the better, Mr. Lincoln declared with some emphasis. But those gentlemen are my guests. If they are to be catechized and cross-examined, I'm the one to do it. But will you? inquired the Secretary eagerly. No, I won't, replied the President. Why, Mr. President, cried Mr. Sanders, he don't pester us one grain. Mr. President, I have just one more question to ask, said the Secretary. "'Fire away!' exclaimed Mr. Sanders. "'Did the man Doyle give you a dispatch to be delivered at the War Department?' "'He did,' replied Bethune. "'I suspected that it was a trap laid for us, opened it, and had it deciphered. "'I kept a copy of the translation, and will now take occasion to present it to the President, "'so that he may see how the lives of human beings are trafficked in by those who desire to win Mr. Stanton's favor. "'We fell into the hands of a man named Autry, but we insisted that he should bring us to the President.' He handed the copy of the dispatch to Mr. Lincoln, who read it, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. Then he turned to Bethune, and regarded him with a half-humorous, half-melancholy, but wholly attractive smile. "'May I see this extraordinary dispatch, Mr. President?' asked the secretary, holding out his hand for it. "'You have no objection?' the President nodded to Bethune. "'None in the world, Mr. President,' was the calm and confident reply. "'Well, anyhow, I reckon I better put it in my pocket.' said Mr. Lincoln, in his slow, deliberate way. It might worry you, Stanton, and it's a matter too trifling for you to be worried about. No. 
I'll take charge of it myself. With that, he folded the copy carefully and placed it in an old Morocco pocketbook. He was absorbed in thought a moment or two, drumming on the table with his fingers. Then he lifted his head and laughed, remarking, It reminds me of a story I heard. Good night, Mr. President. Good night, Hudspeth, exclaimed the secretary sharply as he arose from the table. You two, he said, indicating Bethune and Mr. Sanders, will hear from me again. My post office is Salem and Gianni remarked Mr. Sanders, in his matter-of-fact way. This was too much for Mr. Lincoln, who laughed uproariously as Stanton stalked out. But he suddenly grew grave again. I'm always forgetting my dignity, he declared. Stanton is angry, and he has a right to be. But if he had seen this affair, tapping his pocket, he'd have half a regiment on guard here, and he'd keep it up until I went out and dismissed him, as a country showman dismisses his audience. Congressman Hudspeth had a good many questions to ask about old acquaintances, and he and Mr. Sanders were soon engaged in a friendly discussion over the rights and wrongs of the war. It was a discussion altogether useless, a fact which the President called attention, with the result of putting an end to it. Shortly afterward, Mr. Hudspeth, he being a prominent member of the military committee, excused himself and retired, and Bethune and Mr. Sanders soon followed his example. "'I had asked you to sit up with me a while,' said the President, but I'll have a busy night of it. Come tomorrow night about ten. We must talk about your trip south. Miss Brandon, as she calls herself, is very particular, and we must try and meet her views. You leave her to me, Mr. President, remarked Mr. Sanders suggestively. Gladly, gladly, my friend, exclaimed Mr. Lincoln so heartily that Mr. Sanders was compelled to laugh, and even Bethune smiled. Curiously enough, neither of the Southerners, as they returned to their apartments, spoke of the scheme which had originally brought them to Washington. Each was anxious that the other should make a suggestion to abandon it altogether, while each, for reasons that will be clear to every masculine mind, hesitated about making such a suggestion. Thus it was that neither mentioned the plan in any shape or form that night or the next day. It was a queer situation, and it was altogether characteristic that Bethune should worry over its embarrassments while Mr. Sanders was inwardly chuckling over its humorous features. It was not until they were about to leave the hotel at the hour agreed upon that a word was said on the subject. "'I reckon you're feeling a little nervous, Frank,' suggested Mr. Sanders. "'Not more than you, I venture,' replied Bethune calmly. As Mr. Sanders had expected a somewhat different reply, he merely pursed his lips as though he were going to whistle, and said no more. The carriage was at the door, and Bethune and Mr. Sanders were driven swiftly to the White House. The two Southerners found Mr. Lincoln in high good humor. He welcomed them in the heartiest manner, slapping Mr. Sanders on the back and displaying in the most unaffected manner his delight at seeing two friends from Georgia, as he called them. "'You must have heard good news, Mr. President,' suggested Bethune. "'Well, if I had, I wouldn't tell you fellows. It would be bad news to you. But, as an old friend of mine used to say, no news is good news. And when there's no fuss in the family, and no quarrel about a fence line, and the cow is giving down her milk, and the hens are laying—' The man who forgets to be happy will miss a mighty good chance. That's so, assented Mr. Sanders. By the way, said Mr. Lincoln, turning to Bethune, what put it into that man's head to charge you fellows with plotting to kidnap the President? Doyle, you mean? Well, Mr. President, he could as easily have charged us with plotting to assassinate the President. I wonder he didn't, since all he had to do was choose the word, replied Bethune. Well, when you two get back, what will you do to this man? asked Mr. Lincoln. "'Why, we are in hopes this case will be attended to before we lay eyes on him again,' was the answer. "'Is that so?' exclaimed Mr. Lincoln, sitting bolt upright. Then he laughed lightly, and leaned back again, throwing one of his long legs over the arm of his chair. "'Well!' "'Don't be too hard on them.' The President, leaning back with his hands behind his head, gazed at the ceiling in silence for some time, apparently in a profound study. Then he laughed aloud at some amusing thought— and once more sat upright in his chair. "'Now, about this kidnapping business,' he remarked. "'Do you think it would be an easy matter to kidnap the President?' Mr. Sanders gave a gasp of surprise as he turned in his seat. "'Mr. President,' said Bethune, leaning forward and speaking in grave, measured accents, "'Mr. President, it would be the easiest thing in the world.' "'What time is it?' asked Mr. Lincoln. "'About half after ten, replied Mr. Sanders.' consulting his silver watch, which was as big as a biscuit and weighed about half a pound. Well, Stanton is to be here about half-past eleven, 
and he usually comes ahead of time. Now what I want you to do, Mr. Lincoln went on with some eagerness, is to show me how that kidnapping business could be carried out. Let's suppose a case, what we lawyers call a hypothetical case. Let's take it for granted that, in the performance of your duty, as you look at it, you had concluded that the easiest way to achieve what you call your independence is to seize the president and carry him south. Then, let us suppose that matters had fallen out pretty much as they have. Here you are, two quick-witted confederates. Now show me how the kidnapping could be carried out. But to Mr. President, exclaimed Bethune, that is precisely... Mr. Lincoln stopped him. I know, I know, he cried, and his voice overbore that of Bethune. No, what did he know? I know how you feel about it, but this is purely a hypothetical case. I am supposed to be taken unawares. Both Bethune and Mr. Sanders had arisen from their chairs, partly to conceal their excitement, and partly to seize what seemed to be a providential opportunity. The event had, as it were, been taken out of their hands. They seemed to have no choice in the matter. "'Well, Mr. President, supposing that we had come here on such a mission,' said Bethune, "'it would probably be carried out in this way, making due allowances for emergencies.' He went on to the inner door and looked in. Then he went to the outer door and looked out into the wide entrance. The moment was propitious. He returned, stood by the President's chair, and then touched him sharply on the shoulder. "'Mr. Lincoln, great emergencies sometimes call for cruel remedies.' Bethune's voice was grim in its earnestness. "'We are two Confederates. You are our prisoner. Make no outcry. Not a hair of your head shall be harmed if you obey instructions. The situation is desperate for us, but it is more desperate for you.' The President looked into Bethune's eyes and seemed to understand the situation. "'Well, you'd certainly make a fine actor,' he remarked. "'Come, Mr. President.' "'We have not a moment to lose,' said Bethune. "'Let me get my hat,' suggested the President. "'Having secured this,' he said, "'Some sort of weapon is necessary where force is talked of.' "'What is this?' asked Bethune, holding up a pistol. "'And this,' said Mr. Sanders, holding up its mate. "'The argument is concluded, and the witness is with you,' <laughs> remarked Mr. Lincoln with a chuckle. Then he added, "'But kidnapping can't be carried on on foot. "'I'm a pretty good walker, but if I was to take the studs and lie down in the road,' You'd have some trouble. The carriage waits, Mr. Lincoln, replied Bethune grimly. Remember, you are supposed to be going of your own accord. By jing, exclaimed the president. I reckon this is what the play actors call a full dress rehearsal. He went forward very cheerfully, however. When they came to the carriage, the president entered first, Bethune following. Mr. Sanders mounted to the driver's seat. Where are you, Sanders? inquired Mr. Lincoln. I'm going to take the air, Mr. Sanders replied. "'Well, here, swap hats with me. "'I can't wear mine in here unless we cut a hole in the roof.' "'Mr. Lincoln leaned from the window "'and passed his tall hat up to Mr. Sanders "'and received in return the soft felt hat that Mr. Sanders wore. "'The carriage turned into the street "'and went whistling away in the direction arranged by John O'Mahundro. "'Which way are we going?' the President asked. "'I couldn't say, Mr. President. "'I'm not familiar with this part of the country.' "'Mr. Lincoln said nothing more for some little time. "'Then,' "'Don't you think this affair is getting to be a little too natural?' he suggested. "'I had some such idea, Mr. President,' replied Bethune. "'I was thinking,' said Mr. Lincoln, "'that if Stanton should come to the White House and find me gone and begin to inquire about, "'I was just thinking what would happen to that kinswoman of yours.' "'Well, you would have to reckon with Mrs. Lincoln,' replied Bethune. "'That's so,' assented the President with a chuckle. "'Stanton is not much of a favorite with any of the family except me.' But if Mrs. Lincoln should take alarm, then there would be trouble for the southern lady. This was the new phase of the affair. But Bethune felt that providence or fate had tied his hands. He could do nothing. They went forward rapidly for two or three miles. Then they heard a protesting voice. Hold on there, will you? Ain't you got no eyes in your blame noggin? I lay if I take a rock and knock you off in that barouche, you'll think you saw something. There was a light wagon in the road, to which a couple of horses were hitched. The driver of Bethune's carriage stopped his team, handed the reins to Mr. Sanders, and joined the complaining person, who was no other than John O'Mahundro, in the road. "'Wait,' said the latter in a low tone. He put his hand to his ear and listened. "'I hear a cavalry squad coming. Jump in the carriage, turn around. There's plenty of room here. And drive back the way you came.' "'Any danger for me?' asked the driver. "'Not a bit in the world,' responded O'Mahundro. 
Get a move on you. You want the cavalry to meet you with your horses' heads turned toward town. No time was lost in making this movement. The driver put the last to the horses, as they were making the turn, and when they met the squad of pursuing cavalry, the carriage was moving toward the city at a brisk trot. Halt! cried a commanding voice. Well, if you'd knowed you was halting, maybe you wouldn't be so uppity, exclaimed Mr. Sanders. The captain, making out the outline of Mr. Lincoln's hat, which the genial Georgian was wearing, cried out, Is that you, Mr. President? For answer, Mr. Lincoln leaned his head from the window and said, Yes, it's me. What's the trouble? Any bad news from the front? Speak out, my man. I'm used to trouble. You seem to be excited. What is it? Why, Mr. President, Mr. Stanton is at the White House in a great state of alarm. He thinks you have been seized and carried off. He gave me orders to take ten men, pursue the carriage, and overtake it at all hazards. What, then? asked Mr. Lincoln. He took me aside, Mr. President, exclaimed the captain, and said, when you catch these villains, let your patriotism dictate your course. Well, what does your patriotism dictate? asked Mr. Lincoln dryly. I am under your orders, Mr. President. If you have done to give, I will have the honor of escorting you to the White House. It is unnecessary, replied Mr. Lincoln. Ride on ahead, and when you arrive at the White House, tell Secretary Stanton to disband his forces, horse, foot, and dragoons, take down the barricades, and permit my friends and myself to enter on the terms that have always existed. The officer saluted in the dark, and was about to give the necessary orders, when Mr. Lincoln again spoke. "'What time is it?' The officer struck a match and looked at his watch. Ten fifty, Mr. President. "'Thank you. The secretary was a notch or two ahead of time,' Mr. Lincoln remarked. "'Yes, Mr. President. A man named Doyle arrived from the South tonight, and informed the secretary that two rebels—' "'You mean Confederates, I reckon, Captain,' suggested Mr. Lincoln. Uh, "'Yes, Mr. President.' Two Confederates had come to Washington for the purpose of kidnapping you. When he described the men, the secretary made haste to the White House, summoning me as he went. When he arrived there and found you had gone off at the very men accused by Doyle, you may imagine his excitement. Yes. I'm mighty glad I wasn't there. Well, Captain, you have acted with commendable energy, and I am under obligations to you. Call on me some day at the White House. I want to have a talk with you. Thank you, Mr. President. I have simply done my duty. He wheeled his horse, gave a curt order to his detachment, and the small cavalcade was soon clattering toward the White House, where, in no long time, the captain reported to the secretary, who was still in a fury of rage and excitement. "'Did you seize the two spies? Where are they?' he thundered. "'Under the circumstances, Mr. Secretary, I could but obey the commands of the President.' "'Remain here with your men,' Mr. Stanton said. Then, his fury getting the better of him, he paced up and down the floor, crying, Oh, he will ruin the country! Don't you think you had better restrain yourself, Mr. Secretary? asked Mrs. Lincoln, who, coming out of the state of alarm and apprehension into which she had been thrown by the wild and stormy excitement of Mr. Stanton, was now somewhat angry. Nothing but providence has saved your husband from those two spies and traitors. That is, if he is saved. They had everything planned to carry him off tonight. "'I don't believe a word of it,' exclaimed Mrs. Lincoln. "'But every word is true, madam,' declared Doyle, who was sticking as close to the secretary as he dared. "'They planned it in my presence in Richmond.' "'I don't know you,' replied Mrs. Lincoln. "'What were you doing in Richmond?' "'Serving my country to the best of my poor ability, ma'am.' "'As a spy?' There was so much scorn in the lady's voice that Doyle assumed a more chastened attitude. After a while, the carriage drove up, and the President, Bethune, and Mr. Sanders alighted— Mr. Lincoln was in high glee. As the carriage stopped, he was saying to Bethune, "'You remember when I asked you if the affair wasn't getting to be too natural, too real?' Bethune assented, but the President waited until they were near the portico of the White House. Then he continued, "'Well, I remember it, too. It reminds me of the fellow who set out to play ghost in his village. He had tolerable success, until he happened to run across a crabbed old fellow who had a good deal of money out at interest. The ghost says,' "'Squire Brown, you've got too much money. "'What'll you do with it when you die?' "'Squire Brown gripped his hickory and says, "'You talk lots too natural for a ghost.' "'And with that, he lit in and frailed the fellow out. "'Bethune had no time to digest the moral, "'which might or might not be attached to this brief narrative "'of a village incident. "'As the three walked into the light, "'Secretary Stanton cried out with a voice full of passion. 
Mr. President, I hope you are convinced that I was correct in what I said about those detestable spies. Captain Bird, do your duty. But before the captain could make a movement, Mrs. Lincoln burst into a fit of uncontrollable laughter, in which she was joined by all except Mr. Stanton. Even the officer failed to maintain his dignity. Mr. Lincoln, tall and lank, was wearing Mr. Sanders's felt hat, which, slashed as it was, gave him the aspect of a pirate. On the other hand, Mr. Sanders was wearing Mr. Lincoln's tall beaver. It was tipped to one side a trifle, and this, together with the fact that he wore a bobtail jeans coat, added the last touch of the comic to his rotund figure. Mr. Lincoln joined in and led the laughter, and for several long minutes the hilarity ran high while Mr. Stanton gazed with undisguised scorn and contempt upon the scene. Presently, taking advantage of a lull in the laughter, he cried in harsh, commanding tones, "'Captain Bird, arrest those men!' "'Why, what have we done, Stanton?' demanded Mr. Lincoln. "'What are we guilty of?' The secretary, with an angry gesture, turned to Doyle. "'Mr. President,' said Doyle, "'these men came here to seize you and carry you off. I am willing to make oath to that fact. But for the energy of Secretary Stanton tonight, their plot would have succeeded. "'What is your opinion, Captain Bird? What did you find when you came up with your detachment?' inquired Mr. Lincoln. "'Mr. President, we met the carriage on its way to the White House, and in accordance with your orders, hurried here in advance of it.' "'My friend,' said the President, turning to Doyle, "'if there was any plot to kidnap tonight, I'm the guilty party.' "'That's so, Mr. President,' Mr. Sanders solemnly asserted. "'You not only took us off, but you took my hat. "'It looked to me like mighty squally times out there in the dark road, "'but anyhow, I thank you kindly for fetching us back. "'Oh, you are more than welcome, friend Sanders. "'There's another thing I want to say to you, gentlemen,' "'remarked Mr. Lincoln, straightening himself up. The less you say of this affair, the better. If it slips into the newspapers, I propose to see that the public get the straight of it. One thing more. These gentlemen here, Mr. Bethune and Mr. Sanders, are in Washington by my invitation. They are my guests. I am responsible for their conduct here, and whoever interferes with them will be held responsible by me. Captain Byrd, I thank you again for the energetic way in which you carried out your orders. If the Secretary of War has no more for you tonight, neither have I. Mr. Stanton had retired in disgust to the inner office, where the captain sought him, returning in a moment to bid the President good night and to lead his squad of cavalry to their quarters. Mr. Doyle stood where the Secretary had left him, and his embarrassment was so plain that Bethune, following one of his impulses, said, Mr. President, I think I can set Mr. Doyle right, but before I do so, I'd like to ask what grudge he bears me. "'Grudge? I have no grudge against you,' Doyle asserted. "'Why did you try to use my own hand to entrap me? "'Why did you entrust me with the dispatch in which you committed me to the gallows, "'not for the good of the country, but for the advancement of yourself and your friend Autry?' "'Why, I give you no such dispatch as that,' Doyle asserted. "'Well, the President has a copy of it,' remarked Bethune dryly. "'Mr. Lincoln looked at Doyle with a puzzled expression on his face. "'He seemed to be studying the man. "'It was a very embarrassing stare.' "'What put the notion in your head?' said the President, turning to Bethune with something like a sigh. "'That the gentleman needed to be set right with me. "'It struck me, Mr. President, that you might misunderstand him, "'considering all the circumstances,' replied Bethune. "'No, I think I understand him perfectly.' "'But he still continued to regard Mr. Doyle "'with the puzzled, melancholy expression on his face. "'But if you'll permit me to explain, Mr. President,' Bethune persisted, but Mr. Lincoln shook his head and raised his long arm in a protesting gesture. No, not now. I'll have a talk with this gentleman at another time. You must excuse me now. Bethune, you and Mr. Sanders come into my private office. He bowed to Doyle and went out. As Bethune was following, Doyle caught him by the arm and detained him. What did you intend to say to him? he asked. Why, I intended and still intend to tell him the simple truth, replied Bethune. That you came to kidnap him? gasped Doyle. "'Why, certainly. I don't want him to believe that you are engaged in ensnaring men merely to advance your own fortunes. Do you think I'd do the like for you?' inquired Doyle. "'Why, I never asked myself the question,' replied Bethune, regarding the man with a smile. "'I owe you no goodwill, but I owe to myself to be honest and straightforward. Now, answer me this. Why did you have men ready to follow me out of Richmond?' Doyle hesitated, but finally spoke out. 
I wanted to make sure that you fell into the hands of the right parties when you reached Washington. If I had to do it all over again, it wouldn't be done. And I want to say to you that I'm glad I met you. Well, we have no time for compliments. Good night. Mr. Sanders was waiting for Bethune, and together they went into Mr. Lincoln's private office. The President and Mr. Stanton were in the larger room, and the tones of their voices coming through the door showed that they were conversing as if nothing unusual had occurred. Indeed, it seemed that Mr. Stanton had been, for the moment, entirely subdued. Presently, Mr. Lincoln came to the door. Sanders, you and Bethune come in here. I want you to see that my Secretary of War is not always ready to eat folks up. Mr. Stanton greeted them in a friendly manner. He had his glasses off for the moment, and for the first time the two Southerners saw that in repose his features were cast in a genial mold, and that his eyes could command a kindly expression. Bethune, said the President, what was that explanation you wanted to make about Doyle? Mr. Stanton seems to appreciate his abilities. I don't know how able he is, but that last part of his dispatch doesn't sound nice to me. Mr. Stanton agrees with me about this, but he says the first part is correct. The copy of the dispatch lay open on the table between the President and the Secretary. Mr. President, after what has happened tonight, taking everything as it occurred, I feel sure that you'll not misunderstand my motives when I say to you that the first part of Mr. Doyle's dispatch is correct. Bethune's tone was quiet but firm. I told you so, remarked Mr. Stanton with emphasis. Well, then why didn't you carry out your plan tonight? They had a very good reason, exclaimed the Secretary of War. Mr. President, said Mr. Sanders, suddenly and emphatically, there ain't enough cavalry in the fifty mile of this town to have kept us from carrying you off tonight. You know where we turned around? Well, right there was a light wagon, and all we had to do was hustle you in it. The man a-driving it knows every foot of ground betwixt here and Richmond. No doubt, said Mr. Lincoln. But why didn't you take advantage of all this? Mr. President, I would as soon kidnap my grandfather, or someone else equally dear to me, Bethune declared. But it was a great temptation. It was so, especially to a young feller, remarked Mr. Sanders. When the hosses turned, I fully expected Frank to stick his head out and use some words that you don't hear in parlors. And when he didn't, I never was so happy in my life. What well, we might have done if you hadn't gone and kidnapped yourself right before our face, I can't say. I'm like the fellow the mule kicked in the stomach. Says he, I seed her switch her tail, that I seed pintedly. What she done after that, I can't say. If you would only trust me, Mr. President, exclaimed Mr. Stanton. There was no bitterness in his voice. Why, I trust you precisely as far as I can trust myself, replied Mr. Lincoln earnestly. No man could do more. Would any other man do as much? The secretary made no reply. He resumed his spectacles and turned to Bethune. But why, now that the affair is over, do you come in here and admit what nobody could have proved? What is Doyle to you? Less than nothing, Mr. Secretary. I think the President understands my motives. Perfectly. Perfectly, said Mr. Lincoln. But I don't understand why you changed your mind when you had everything in your own hands. Well, I can only say this, Mr. President that if the plain people of the South knew you as well as we know you, the war wouldn't last much longer. Mr. Lincoln arose from his chair and laid his hand on Bethune's shoulder. My son, he said solemnly, no human being ever did or ever can pay me a higher compliment than that. I wish all your people would take a month off and come up here to kidnap me. They are engaged in some such adventure now, remarked Mr. Stanton dryly. The president paid no attention to the remark, but walked about the room with his hands behind him and his head forward. Finally, he paused and stood before Bethune and Mr. Sanders, his feet planted somewhat apart. "'I'll tell you, gentlemen, the honest truth,' he declared, raising his right arm high above his head. "'My heart bleeds night and day for every wound the war inflicts on both sides. If I know my own mind, I know no north and no south. All that I hope for and pray for is the Union, the Union preserved, and the Union at peace,' with all factions and all parties, working together for the glory and greatness of the Republic. I would, if I could, take the South in my arms and soothe all her troubles, and wipe out all the old difficulties and differences, and start the nation on a new career. I have the will, but not the power. He paused a moment, and then resumed with a smile. Stanton there says I'm a politician, and I reckon I am, but if I were nothing else I'd be ashamed of myself. Mr. President, said Bethune gravely, if we had found you to be a politician, petulant and intriguing, you wouldn't be here tonight. Ain't it the truth? 
exclaimed Mr. Sanders with unction. "'Well, Mr. President,' remarked Mr. Stanton, arising from his chair, "'your friends are more agreeable than I supposed they would be. "'But hereafter I hope you will believe that I know what I am talking about.' "'Why, I never doubted it,' Mr. Lincoln declared. "'But you'll have to take me as you find me.' "'The trouble with him, Mr. President,' said Mr. Sanders, "'is that he's afraid he'll not be able to find you.' The secretary regarded Mr. Sanders from behind his inscrutable glasses, smiled faintly, and exclaimed, "'Ain't it the truth?' Then, as if the effort to mimic Mr. Sanders had thawed him out, he shook hands with the two Southerners, laughing softly to himself, and went out. The episode was sufficient to show that the great war secretary, and he was truly great in his line, could be agreeable when he chose to be. "'That's the only fun he's had since the war begun,' Mr. Lincoln asserted." Nothing more remains to be told. Bethune, Mr. Sanders, and Mrs. Elise Clopton had no difficulty in making their way south. They had an escort through the federal lines and were turned over to their compatriots under a flag of truce. End of the Kidnapping of President Lincoln, 